Hi, everybody. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great. All right, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. A uh, quick announcement, if you are not on mute, if you could mute your mic, that would be great. That makes it so we can all hear. Um, we've got about 100 people on the call right now, so we wanna try to keep that tight. Um, so welcome. Thank you so much for coming this weekend to the People's Movement Assembly towards a People's Constitution. I'm really honored that you're investing your weekend here. Uh, it's, a, it's a big commitment and I so appreciate you being part of this. My name is Jessica Munger. I am Move to Amends Program Director. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I am from Northern California, Maidu land, but I currently live um, in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, Mojave. I see a lot of familiar faces here, hi, and a lot of new faces. Uh, so I'll start by reminding you that Move to Amend is a national grassroots organization working to abolish corporate constitutional rights and money as free speech through the 28th Amendment to the US Constitution. But for Move to Amend and our friends, we see the 28th Amendment as one strategy for dismantling the structures um, and uh, institutions that uphold corporate power and patriarchy and white supremacy and other forms of violence and oppression. We see that as being all related. Um, so I've been working with Move to Amend for over six years and I've talked to a lot of people all over the country about the constitution. I've asked a lot of people if they think we should reimagine the US constitution. And what I hear ranges from how dare you to uh, hell yeah, torch the whole thing. Right? But what's most common to emerge from this conversation is that people know we have a major problem and that those problems are at a systemic level, that they're deeply rooted. Uh, they don't feel like they're being represented. Most of them don't feel protected. And most of them share the sentiment that we need deep change. But also most of them are very overwhelmed by the idea of that level of change. And that's very reasonable, right? Um, it's a huge lift. So I wanna give you two reminders as we open today. If you're feeling some apprehension about the topic of reimagining the US Constitution. One is that there are people who are not on our side, the ruling class, fascists, anti-choice crusaders, white supremacists, and they have this conversation. They plan for a constitutional convention. And for me, what's scarier than the thought of those people having a plan is the idea of us not having a plan. We can't be fearful and meek in our demands and our thinking, or we will be trampled. My second reminder is that we're not rewriting the constitution today. There are very bad people in power and we have a lot of political muscle to build, but all big changes start with big conversations. And that's why we're here today and tomorrow to have a big conversation. 
Uh, we know that it can be overwhelming to, you know, take on the idea of, say, changing the fundamental structure and compass of one of the most powerful and destructive empires in the history of the world. Uh, we're talking about revolutionary change um, because we are in revolutionary times and a time absolutely ripe for change. I feel that strongly and I think you feel it too. So I wanna talk about change for a second. Um, change is inevitable, change is constant. Um, I wanna quote one of my favorite thinkers and authors, Octavia Butler, who many of us have turned to in this time. She says, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Butler also reminds us that we have the power to shape change and thus in her philosophy to shape God. No matter if these specific words resonate with you or not, the idea is that we're shaping the future. No matter what we do, we shape the future. So let's be agents for change for a radically better world and let's shape change towards the world that we want and deserve because a better world actually is possible. I want you to come into this weekend and I invite you to check your fears at the door right now. I invite you to embrace the process that we're gonna go through this weekend and try to be present. I encourage you to give yourself permission to be wild and bold and visionary and think about things outside of what you've been taught is possible or likely. The People's Movement Assembly is a process that requires us to stick with it and be courageous and patient and visionary. Usually we do this in person where we can generate that energy and share space with each other and eat together and create a feeling that I'm not sure can totally be replicated over a computer screen. Um, so please bear with us. We've never done a virtual PMA before. We will likely learn some lessons. Uh, the technology requires some adjustments and some awkwardness. So please go with the flow, please be kind. And keep in mind that this event isn't something we're putting on for you. It's something that we've created space for and that we all contribute to together. So your perspective, energy and investment is part of what will make this weekend whatever it's going to be. So I wanna thank everyone so much for being here and a major thanks to the organizations who came together with us at Move to Amend to craft this event. The Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, A Radical Guide, the Pachamama Alliance, Liberty Tree Foundation for the Democratic Revolution. Thank you to all of our speakers and presenters and artists and small group anchors and organizers, mentors, and to Jason and Alfonso who are running the tech for this call today. Thank you so much. Um, you know what you're doing and I really appreciate that. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. We're gonna go now into an overview of the PMA process so you can figure out what to expect for this weekend. All right, thanks Jason. So the People's Movement Assembly is a process uh, based on a facilitation method, uh, methodology for collective thinking visioning, alliance building, decision-making and action planning. The social, movement, the social movement assembly results in actions based on the vision and ideas that come out of this process. It's a strategy for getting folks together to talk about a particular thing and collect a bunch of people's experiences and perspectives and set something in motion. It's a participatory process where we all lend our unique and whole selves uh, to go through a series of questions to bring together and better define our vision and path forward. People's Movement Assembly is not just something that happens once and gets wrapped up in a neat package. Um, it's a practice. So it's something that we'll do again and again. It'll feel messy and imperfect and you might feel frustration and impatience sometimes. Um, and as we'll learn about more this weekend, when people work towards constitutional renewal or reform, it's not quick and clean, um, at least not if it's democratic, right? Because democracy itself is a practice and the People's Movement Assembly is a democratic practice in itself. The three questions um, that make up the, the structure of the PMA in this context are, what is the current moment? what's happening and why, uh, how did we get here, right? The second question is, what is our vision? And what is the best thing we can imagine? What's the world that we want and deserve? And for the sake of this PMA, 
what's our vision for a people's constitution? Um, the third question is, how do we move towards that vision? What's already happening and what can we set in motion? So that's the general framework uh, that we're gonna use to navigate through this conversation. So let me tell you about today's agenda specifically. Here we are opening comments, reminders, assumptions, um, give you a, a feel for what we're doing. Then we're gonna set the context. We're gonna have a grounding exercise. Uh, we're gonna have a poetic moment. Uh, an artist share some words with us, Eleanor Goldfield. And then we're gonna have a panel um, with some speakers who have been thinking about this a long time and will give us context for the conversations that we have. Um, then we'll move into our first breakout group. So that's the first question that I showed you before. That's defining the current moment, the context, challenges, and opportunities that are in front of us right now. And then uh, we'll take a break and we'll come back and do breakout session number two with a new group of folks, which is the time for us to envision a people's constitution. That's the really fun, big thinking, visionary part. If we could have anything, what would we want? So that's Saturday. Um, and then tomorrow we'll come back here, same link, uh, same time and place, a little shorter day tomorrow. So we'll open again with a grounding exercise and another poetry share by Patriot X. Uh, we'll have a presentation by Ben Mansky, who is an expert in such things. Um, and then we'll have our third breakout group, which is when we take the vision that we craft today and we start thinking, okay, what can we do to get to that vision to realize that plan? Um, and then we'll close. And uh, that's, that's what we have for this weekend. But we have to understand that the PMA is a much longer uh, process. And again, it's setting something in motion. So there'll be a lot that will come out of this weekend that we don't know yet, because we don't have that, um, that vision crafted yet. So that's the, that's the plan. Um, please go with the flow. I know it's a lot. I want to give you some uh, tips and some expectations that we have for how to maximize this weekend. Um, the standards that we expect coming into this group are what we, uh, what we always expect, which is uh, mutual respect for each other, right? We're all here because we want to do something good. So if you're here, um, we respect you and we hope that you share that with your other group mates too. Courage, um, because this is a bold conversation and a conversation that a lot of people are very scared of. And I think it takes courage to have conversations about things that you might not know that much about or have conversations that feel like you are asking for more than what people think you should be allowed to ask for. So have courage and open-mindedness always helps. Um, and then I ask that you have an attention to power dynamics and uh, microaggressions. Um, like I said, uh, you're gonna be uh, in spaces where there's lots of people that you're talking with. Be aware of how much space you're taking up and the dynamics that exist in cross-class, cross-race, cross multi-gender, multi-generational groups. Um, and then some tips for maximizing. Like I said before, uh, trust the process. Uh, settle in, help us to create a feeling of togetherness that really is gonna take all of us to do if we're on camera. Uh, keep your camera on when you can. It really helps to make it feel like we're together. Um, I know you sometimes have to turn it off, but when you can, that would be great. You're going to feel some impatience during this process. I'm warning you now. You're going to feel some lack of resolution. That's normal, and you should work through it. This is a marathon, and a weekend isn't a very long time. Um, so let that happen. That's okay. Uh, I encourage you to take care of yourself. Drink water, go to the bathroom when you need to, eat with your microphone off, please. Um, do what you need to do to be here. Um, we have a built-in uh, built break today, but you might need more time. That's fine. Um, do what you gotta do. And then uh, keep some notes. It'll help you to collect your thoughts between your turns speaking and help you keep track of some of the interesting stuff you learn. Um, and then unless you're speaking in your discussion groups, please keep your mic muted just so we can uh, keep the audio clean and hear everyone who's speaking. So thank you so much. I'm gonna hand it over now to Greg, who is gonna go over some of the assumptions that we're starting out with today. So you know where we're coming from. Thank you again. Well, thank you, Jessica. Um, just before we start, just wanted to acknowledge uh, the role Jessica has played in being the main sort of facilitator, enabler, and keeping us all together. Done a terrific job. So well done, Jessica. 
Uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. If you recall, you agreed when registering to be at least mostly in agreement with the following assumptions that are the basis for our time together both today and tomorrow. Uh, as mentioned, this is not a space to debate if we should renew the Constitution, um, but rather what is our vision for a people's constitution. So here are the 11 assumptions that are the starting point for this gathering. Number one, the USA is not now, nor has it ever been democratic. Two, the United States was founded on stolen land and built using stolen labor from enslaved people. Three, the US constitution was created by and for the wealthy elite of the era, excluding most people living on the land at the time of its crafting. Specifically, the Constitution was written to protect and represent white men with money and or land. Four, the US Constitution is a property rights document, not a human rights document. Five, the US Constitution was used to perpetuate and to legalize attempt to genocide, white supremacy and racism, male domination over women and class oppression. It took mass movements, broad, deep, conscious, organized and educated to make marginal improvements in this country. With each hard won expansion of suffrage, the governing elite devised mechanisms to shrink what effect the vote would have and still are doing it. Six, any movement that wants to create to want to actually create a new world must create new institutions, including new legal institutions that meet people's needs without destroying the planet that we depend upon for life itself. Seven, all laws should be contingent on and subordinate to the highest laws, unalienable rights shared equally by all. Because unalienable rights are, should be the things most highly valued by society and immune from regulation limitation. The establishment, protection, and enforcement of unalienable rights must be the Constitution's reason for being and should direct freedom to govern in all things in the hands of each community, except wherein a law would limit or violate anyone's unalienable rights. Eight, the Constitution of any country at its best reflects its collective inspirations and aspirations. It defines the legal framework of how people structure their society, politically, economically, and socially. Moreover, constitutions are moral or ethical documents designating what is right and wrong with profound implications on literally every aspect of our lives, of the lives of people, their communities, country, and the natural world. Nine. The US Constitution should be renewed or rewritten to account for new generations and circumstances and should exist as a living document which reflects the challenges and opportunities of the times. 10, in order to move toward new systems and a new foundational document, we must be bold and visionary in imagining a better world. And lastly, 11, the ultimate goal of mass movements is not only to change the culture, but to codify movement demands into laws and most importantly, rights. Well, hopefully everyone uh, is uh, comfortable with that. Uh, that is what uh, you basically signed up for. Um, well, at this point, I wanna turn it over to George Friday, who is um, on the national board of Move to Amend as well as for many years and dare I say decades, uh, a national leader uh, in peace, uh, social and racial justice, economic justice and all things justice. George. Thanks, Greg. All right then, morning y'all. It's good to be able to see you. I'm glad we're here together, but let's make sure we're here together, all right? So, I know I have five minutes. I'll try not to use all of it, but I'm not gonna be shy about using all of it either. We're gonna start off by breathing together, something called square breathing, because we're gonna draw a square. And when we go from left to right or right or left, we're gonna inhale. And when we go down or up, we're gonna exhale. 
Okay, so fingers up. This is exercise in the pandemic age. This is exercise. All right. So we're going to go inhale, down, exhale. Cross inhale, up, exhale. Again, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Continue that. You don't have to draw. I don't have to watch you draw. I trust you are. Across is inhale, down or up is exhale. You're continuing that. I can see some of you aren't. So please breathe properly. Continue doing that. And now we're going to do a little bit more because I know I've got more time. Let me do my breathing. Okay. You don't have to close your eyes, but I like it. So now as you continue square breathing, I'm kind of drawing a square in my head. My head kind of moves. Please pay attention to the top of your head. Can you feel your hair? If you have hair. Can you feel the tiny bits of hair if you don't have hair? Maybe the breeze on the top of your head if their wind is open. And now pay attention to your face, ears, eyelids, eyebrows. Still doing square breathing. It's a lot of multitasking, but we're gonna be doing a lot today. Continue square breathing, paying attention to your face. And now your neck. If your hair is long enough, you may feel it on the back of your neck. Otherwise, your neck is holding your head up. I put on a scarf just for this part of the exercise. Oh, uh, now your shoulders down to your arms. Are your arms resting on your lap, hanging by your sides, wiggling your fingers? And now put your hands on your knees if you can. I'm sitting at my desk, so my feet are flat on the floor. If you're in a position where your feet are flat on the floor, your hands are on your knees, that's the position I hope that you're in, continuing your square breathing. And yes, I'm doing my square breathing and speaking. Thank you very much. So now we're going to do a little bit of magic. A couple more before we're done. Got about two more minutes. All right, then. So get your hands on your knees. You can still aware of the top of your head and your face, your shoulders, your arms. From the palm of your hand to the top of your knee, to the arch of your feet, I want you to send energy down from the palm of your hand through to the arch of your feet. That could be a spiral of light, a jolt of lightning, a flow of beautiful love through your knee, down your leg, exiting through arch of your feet. And now, continuing your square breathing, I trust that. In your next inhale, inhale energy back up from the arch of your feet, essentially from earth, up through the palm of your hand and send it back to your elbows. For me, my elbows rest at my hips. Wherever your elbows rest on your legs or your body, you're sending that energy back up through your elbows, all the way into the base of your spine. So now we've got energy coming up from earth to the base of our spine. For me, that spirals of light. For you, it could be some other symbol of the energy moving up, up to your spine. And now you can feel that energy as it hits your spine because there's some warmth now just below your belly button. You got that? Yeah, that's right. And when you inhale, you feel that energy. You exhale, it expands. When you're inhaling, you're taking that energy in. You exhale, you send the energy through your body. The next time you inhale, take that energy in and exhale it 
through your spine all the way up to the top of your head. And now you're connected from earth to sky. And you're here. Woohoo! Sorry to be so loud. I'm just glad that we're here. I get excited. We're going to have a great day. So awesome that you're here, that you're putting your time, your energy into this. Oh, one last thing I didn't mention. Someone did remind me. So through the, today's process, and maybe we get a chance to remind this maybe in breakout groups, remember that in this process, especially for the creative part, you don't have to use your intellect. We know that you're brilliant. Remember that you've got some other people helping you, ancestors, mentors, those folks who's passed on, who really love you and know we got to get it right. They're here. So you can call on when you need them. Do not hesitate as it's happening. So Eleanor, Eleanor is going to give us something beautiful now. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, George. I don't like to follow that act though. That was, <laughs> that was really wonderful. I feel so much better uh, in these stressful times. Uh, that was a wonderful grounding exercise. Thank you. Uh, and hello, everyone. It's awesome to see some of you that, um, that I've, I've seen before, though it's been a hot minute. Uh, and it's great to be here in general. Uh, so yeah, I, I wanted to just share a spoken word piece. But before I do that, kind of explain like what it is that uh, what it is that I do and why it's important, not personally what I do, but in general. Uh, and I'll start with a, a quote, um, both from Bertolt Brecht and uh, James Baldwin. So the Bertolt Brecht quote goes, art is not a mirror held up to reality, but a hammer with which to shape it. Um, and the, the James Baldwin quote is only poets, and by that I mean all artists, know what it is to be alive on this planet and survive it. Uh, and so it's kind of like that, mentality that that uh, amplifies the importance of art and by art I don't just mean like uh, artistic mediums like music and visual art but actually creative thinking and George uh, mentioned that too um, you know the sort of programmed thinking that we uh, are <laughs> are bombarded with and propagandized with in this country will have us rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic but creative thinking will have you making rafts out of deck chairs um, and that's the importance of art and that's the importance of creative thinking. Um, and sure, like ultimately like art won't topple empires, but it'll inspire the people who do. Um, and, you know, creative thinking is radical thinking and it is anti-capitalist thinking and it is thinking that pushes us outside the confines again, uh, that they want us to stay in. And particularly right now in the time of COVID, uh, when we feel especially raw from all of the designed failings that most of us knew were there, but are even more stark in this time. Uh, art's a cornerstone of how we build community, uh, you know, and in mutual aid spaces, it's how we share our stories, how we keep stories alive uh, that have been buried uh, by, by the system on purpose. Uh, it's how we build new ones, how we build new worlds. Like the Zapatistas said, uh, we want a world where many worlds are possible. Uh, that sort of creative thinking is how we build those worlds. Um, it's an invitation to think and act radically and act uh, and think outside the box. So with that, I just wanted to share a little, uh, a little spoken word piece that I wrote um, specifically for this, this time and place. It's called Play. What a strange time to write poetry. What a strange time to play music. What a strange time to build barricades and light Molotov dreams. What a strange time to rattle thrones. To breathe tear gas and sage, to smell change, to pray with raised fists, to meditate in bellowed screams. What a strange time to smile, to laugh, to wear masks that reveal who we are, to dance when we know the world is watching to forge silver linings in hurricanes, to write our stories in graffiti on monuments to a whitewashed history. A strange time, the siren song of normal, a normal that was so strange. Do you remember? 
that mirage, a facade of democracy, a well-dressed hypocrisy, now naked, obvious, true. Illusions die hard and they always haunt the living. Everything wasn't all right, isn't all right, may not be all right. I'm not all right. And if you're not all right, that's all right. Because through a trembling hand, I can write poetry. With aching arms, we can build. Through tired eyes, we can see. And with weak knees, we can fight. In the din of toppling empires, we can rest. In these cramped corners, we can make worlds. We are historic, we are futuristic. We are placeholders for infinity. We won't be here again, but we are here now in these strange days, in these strange ways. And you can stop us like you can stop the sunrise. Seeds will grow and others will burn. The fire inside is your ancestral guide. Call on it now. As we swoop into trenches, navigate underworlds, catch glimpses of sky and carve hope in our minds. Feel summer soaked concrete and our feet pound streets, sewing our dreams with silver threads, weaving wonder in a weary world. And these songs of freedom drown out our fears, carrying a tune from the fields to the mines, from Haymarket to Zuccotti Park. It's this chorus of improvised beats, no solos, but symphonies rising more and more, a crescendo electric tripping that light fantastic, bombastic. This ain't a requiem mass, it's a love song. To militant joy, to radical resolve, to the solidarity of the shaken, to the emergent divergent, and like root systems finding our way home, to the fight, to the build. Heartbeats pulse, the rhythm of our place, our time. No pause, no rewind, play. Thank you. Beautiful, ah, I love it. Thank you so much, Eleanor. <laughs> Thank you. Um. So I, we're about ready to get going, um, but uh, I'm really glad that you were able to join us and kick us off in that way. Eleanor is one of the most powerful people I know and really appreciate her being here. My name is Caitlin. I work with Move to Amend 2 and um, I'm from New Mexico and Northern California, but I am in Arizona right now. Um, and I just wanted to give a little bit of context, uh, but I think we're really close to being ready to go. So I don't know that I need to take my whole time. I think this conversation has been a long time coming. We obviously are not the only ones who are having this conversation right now, even just in the last week, um, we have been seeing more and more places where people are starting to talk about the constitution in a very different way than um, we are used to. So that's very exciting. Um, and I think that the reason why that's happening is because we're in a time of change. We're in a time of big change and my whole life, I'm 41 years old, my whole life, the idea that there was going to be some kind of big change was really unrealistic and really not on the table. And really it was something for like maybe down the road someday, some generation, sometime. And if we just keep on kind of fighting, we'll maybe be moving the ball forward a little bit, but we're not gonna be here to see it. But we are here right now, we're seeing it right now. Um, and we have been seeing it for the last several years in kind of slower motion. Some people paying more attention than others to the signs. Um, but I think that, you know, 2020 has sort of like the accelerator has been put on. And I think that I probably am not the only one who's <laughs> here in this room 
who's feeling like there's a lot of chaos going on. But as George Friday, one of my mentors and dear friends has said many, many times, change is chaos. Chaos is change. Those things go together. So the fact that we're feeling chaos is good because that means that change is happening. When shit's stagnant, then it doesn't feel chaotic. It feels stuck and stable and like the US empire has for most of my life but right now it feels chaotic as hell, right? And that doesn't mean that it's all gonna be good. And that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be um, collateral damage. And that doesn't mean that we can hide from the fact that the uh, fabric of the ecosystem that we rely on is, is being ripped apart by our actions as a species. But, in all of that chaos and in all of that confusion comes the possibility of actually being able to make change. And this planet needs us to make that change so badly, right? We need it so badly. So this event is not the first time we have had this conversation, but it feels really different now. We, when I say we, we as Move to Amend, this is literally not the first time that we have actually done this PMA. It's definitely the first time we've done it in a computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but it is not the first time that we have had it, but it feels way different than any other time that we've had it because it feels like we're meeting the moment instead of way ahead of it. And so I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited that you're here with us today to share this with us and to get this going in a more mainstream way and kind of meet all of the confusion that people have been feeling as uh, the US empire is shaking from its own weight and to help steer the way that it falls. So I think I am gonna pass it over to Keon who's gonna be our MC for the rest of this event. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Uh, and thank you for my fellow uh, members of Move to Amend and uh, partners in this uh, People's Movement Assembly process. My name is Keon Bliss. I'm the grassroots director for Move to Amend. Uh, I'm also a local uh, community organizer uh, and grassroots activist uh, living in Sacramento on Miwok, Maidu, and Nisanon lands, but I'm currently talking to you from uh, Tokobaga and Seminole lands uh, near Tampa, Florida. And um, today we have a uh, a great panel discussion uh, that we are going to be uh, talking with several uh, important scholars uh, and activists and uh, uh, around the what it takes to center um, or create a people's constitution and really getting some uh, concrete thoughts on that. And I really want to thank also um, Eleanor for a great spoken word and offering. But um, I, I also want to open with a uh, powerful quote from uh, that I think will guide this conversation a bit. Uh, I'm for truth, no matter who tells it. I'm for justice, no matter who it is for or against. I'm a human being first and foremost, and as such, I am for whoever and whatever benefits humanity as a whole. Um, quote from Malcolm X. And I think this is a really important conversation because uh, this is important uh, to think about because right now we're in a conversation where we're talking about how do we create a people's constitution that prioritizes our humanity as well as what, uh, as a whole, as well as what um, benefits humanity, particularly the planet, um, first and foremost, uh, rather than the property driven um, property rights document that we currently have. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, our, pan uh, I'm going to give a brief intro for each speaker and uh, remind folks, um, uh, we have sent full ahead of time. So uh, we're just going to uh, talk or truncate bios here for the sake of time, but uh, I want to first introduce um, Isha Krish Krishano Swami, uh, in a who is a bold thinker, lawyer, writer, and media contributor with expertise in corporate capture of government. Um, hello, Isha. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. And um, yeah. I don't know. 
<laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, and thank you so much for doing. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And next up, uh, we have Mark Charles, who is a Native American activist, public speaker, consultant, journalist, and blogger, reformed pastor, computer programmer, and is currently running as an independent candidate for U.S. president. Hello, Mar uh, Mark. You'd like to say hello? Yeah, hey, let me just introduce myself very quickly. Mark Charles, Yanishia. That's my traditional Navajo greeting. My mother is American of Dutch heritage. I am, uh, my father is Navajo, and I am a dual citizen of the United States and the Navajo Nation. And I'm speaking to you today from what's now known as Washington, D.C., but these are the traditional lands of the Piscataway. And I want to honor the Piscataway. I have met some of the Piscataway. I am deeply grateful for their stewardship of these lands. And I want to acknowledge that they're the host people of the lands where I am speaking from today. Thank you so much, Mark. It's an honor to have uh, you all here today. Uh, next up is Ben Price, uh, who is who has 16 years of experience challenging state and federal legalization of corporate assaults against people and their environments. Ben is also an author and deeply involved with many organizations, including one of our partners for this event, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Hello, Ben. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I can and hi to everyone else. Thanks for being here. Um, anxious to have the conversation with everyone. Uh, just for context, I'm in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, the east side of it, uh, and uh, the original people here um, in, near where I live would have been the, the Lanai Lenape people. So, Thank you so much, Ben, and uh, welcome to uh, all of our wonderful panelists for joining us today. So just a quick overview of uh, this panel discussion. So we will uh, we have 45 minutes uh, to engage in this conversation. Uh, we'll be asking uh, three questions uh, and give each speaker um, a chance to answer uh, set with a set amount of time. Um, my colleague, Greg Coleridge, will, so be, wonderful. will be keeping time. Uh, and uh, for speakers, you will hear a sound indicating when you have a one uh, a one minute warning and the same sound when your time is up. Um, so we will try and give each speaker a chance to answer each question as thoroughly as time will allow. And uh, we don't have much uh, much time to uh, to provide for open discussion or uh, responses back. So I will um, uh, try and, and keep uh, keep everybody's uh, time allotted uh, in, in equitable proportion as best I can. And um, if you have questions uh, for the panelists, uh, they may not get answered uh, right away in this discussion, but uh, feel free to add them into the chat and we will make sure that we get you an answer uh, here uh, by the end of the weekend. With that, uh, we will start with the first question. So uh, developing a people's constitution is a legal then rather than a like, cycle is illegal and a psychological is I'm sorry. Developing a people's constitution is less illegal than a psychological challenge. How do we help people accept not just the enormity and urgency of the task, but also that the constitution is in a, is fundamentally what in a fundamental ways unjust and incomplete and should reflect the concerns of authentic people's movements. Each of our uh, each of you will have up to five minutes each to answer, and we will start uh, the the responses off with Mark Charles. Thank you. Thank you very much. One of the things I say to people, especially to get over the psychological edge of changing the Constitution, is we just, it has to be changed. Um, I challenge people all over the country when I travel and speak and say, if you really think the Constitution was meant to be inclusive, I welcome you to get on a Zoom call and read it out loud. Make sure you invite some women, make sure you invite members of LGBTQ, make sure you have some natives and some African Americans in the room and read the constitution out loud. Most people who would even think about doing this would find themselves shocked within a few minutes of starting their reading how actually exclusive the constitution is. This is true with all of our foundations. Even if you listened uh, just the other day to Joe Biden who was talking during, um, the, uh, during one of the debates and he said, uh, talking about the Declaration of Independence. And he said, our Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Declaration of Independence doesn't say that. It says all men are created equal. 
And then 30 lines later, it refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. The Constitution starts with the words, we the people. Article 1, Section 2, which is the section that defines who is and who is not included in this union, who is and who is not a part of this Constitution. First of all, it never mentions women, and that's in, that, that, you have to note that. If you read the entire Constitution, preamble down to the 27th Amendment, you will find that there are 51 gender-specific male pronouns, 51 he, him, and his, who can run for office, who can hold office, even who's protected by this Constitution. There's not a single female pronoun in the entire document, and the document actually lifts up or counts as superior men. So it never mentions women. It specifically excludes natives and accounts Africans as three-fifths of a person. Who does that leave us with? Well, in 1787, that literally left us with white men. And technically, it was white landowning men who could vote. We see this also throughout our Constitution. If you read our 13th Amendment, which most people think abolishes slavery, it doesn't. What it says is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, whereas the party has been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. The 13th Amendment doesn't abolish slavery. It redefines and codifies it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system, which now makes sense why we have the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world and why we incarcerate our people of color at three to five times the rate that we incarcerate white people. When I was reading the Constitution as an adult, this was probably five or six years ago, I started the preamble and read all the way through the 27th Amendment, and I was so appalled by what I read I decided I wanted to edit it. So I downloaded the draft onto my computer. And every time I came across a gender specific male pronoun, I put a strike through font through it and replaced it with either a proper noun or a gender neutral pronoun. Every time I came across language excluding one group of people or lifting up another group of people, I put a strike through font through it. Yes, we shouldn't have said that. When we got to the clause in the 13th Amendment, I put a strike through font through that clause. So the 13th Amendment would actually read, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States, period. I didn't change balance of powers. I didn't change checks and balances. I merely removed the racism, the sexism, and the white supremacy from our Constitution. So I made the Constitution say what most people think it says in the first place. And that's the, the, one of the biggest psychological challenges our nation faces in changing the Constitution is we think it's some sort of sacred text. It's not a sacred text. It's a text of a few ideas, some stolen from Native communities, others from these white landowning men who were very racist, sexist, and white supremacists themselves, and they happen to write them down. Our Constitution is not sacred, and our Constitution is actually the problem. Most people believe the United States of America is racist, sexist, and white supremacist in spite of our foundations. The truth is, we are racist, sexist, and white supremacist as a nation because of our foundations. There's not a single corporation out there operating on bylaws written in the 1500s, the 1600s, or even the 1700s, yet we run a nation based on language in a document written in 1787. If we were a corporation, we would have been sued long time ago. But because we're a nation that has a self-proclaimed manifest destiny, we haven't yet corrected the language in our constitution. But one of the things I advocate most boldly for is we have to just go in and remove this racism, this sexism, and this white supremacy. And we have the right to do that. This is our constitution. We have the right to go in and edit this document and we can actually make it say what we want it to say. I have a TEDx talk that I gave. It's called We the People, the Three Most Misunderstood Words in U.S. History. And in that TEDx talk, I advocate that we need to make these changes to the Constitution and that we actually have the power as a nation to begin that process and to do it. And I don't think it needs to be a very big deal. It actually it's not that big of a deal. We actually can make it say what most people think it says anyway. So as far as the psychological barrier, the most people who have a psychological barrier to changing the constitution is white landowning men. And that's because the document protects them. Everyone else would love to have a document that when they read it, 
they actually would have to would, would be able to read it and acknowledge that the language in this document actually includes them. Today, if you want to be in the military, if you want to serve in public office, if you want to be a judge, you have to take a pledge to uphold the document, hoping it means something that it doesn't actually say. If you're a woman, if you're a member of LGBTQIA, if you're a person of color, you have to take that pledge, hoping this document means something it doesn't actually say. So I think we can handle decentering white landowning men a little bit, have them get over themselves, and let's create a document where for the very first time, we the people actually means all the people. Thank you so much, Mark, for that insightful response. Uh, next up, I'm going to uh, pass the mic to Isha uh, for you have five minutes. Go ahead. Hello, um, everyone. Can you um, hear me? Um, I'm, I respect Mark a lot, but I do have one small correction. It's not land owning men, it's property owning men. And if you think of 1787, who are the property owners? Then think who were the property. <laughs> um, and so even James Madison in the Constitutional Convention said that the purpose of the government is to protect the opulent minority from the tyranny of the majority. So who is the opulent minority? Those are people with property who are being, whose property is being protected by people, I guess, without property or people who may be considered property. That part's a little unclear. Um, so it's written in the Constitutional Convention. And for people who think that we don't need a constitutional change, let's just look at some of the decisions and you tell me, well, just think about what year you expect this decision. So in one case, the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional for California to change their statute of limitations for getting compensation for the Holocaust um, and, and the use of slave labor. This was in 2003. Um, and also to add to Mark's point about it not protecting everyone's right to property. Well, in two, about 2003 or four, there was a, a decision uh, against the Oneida nations where everyone's favorite liberal justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, basically invoked the doctrine of discovery, which is a doctrine written by some European king, basically that says that if you are a Christian person, you can go invade all non-Christian people. On top of that, the logic for her was that, oh, the looting happened a long time ago and people are used to having already had their land looted. So giving compensation would be unfair. And this was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the liberal justice, just so you know. Um, and over and over, what you'll see is that there is no logical f consistency. You, money is speech, but right to form a union is not an assembly, not freedom of assembly. Um, you can, there, and that's the First Amendment. Um, with the Fourth Amendment, I mean, after 9-11, it's a, it's a joke. And finally, what about, and the number of times that the 14th Amendment, which is the Equal Protection Clause, protects corporations is astonishing. And a few weeks ago, I was just thinking, if corporations are people, why don't they get the death penalty like people when they commit atrocities? And some of the corporations that exist today in America have committed atrocities like um, Monsanto and Bayer. They did the Holocaust. Um, uh, uh, JP Morgan Chase basically crashed the world economy twice and they're still allowed to exist. And so, um, and so in some ways corporations have more rights than people. 
And one thing that we do need to think about is the urgency. So about a few years ago, Lula da Silva had a quote from Pablo Neruda where he said, the elite can kill one rose, two roses, three roses, or even a hundred roses, but they can't stop the arrival of spring. And I thought, not yet. And climate change, they will stop the arrival of spring. And a lot of us, we don't have that much time because for climate change to get us. And what we do know is that capitalism and the environment, we have to choose one. And I would like to have a livable planet. And so the if for people who are not convinced that we need a new constitution, I just ask you to read over a few Supreme Court decisions, even in this week, like that came out, and you will be horrified at all sorts of logics. Like they go into logic twists. They'll try to say that it's some sort of deep principle, but it's not. They're totally making it up as they go along with their own biases. And also, it should and it's also based on the fundamental mistrust of the democracy because the check and the balance is to protect the opulent minority, aka rich, from the tyrannical majority or people who will later um, want to have equal rights. And that fundamentally it cannot be democracy when we have so much inequality because as even Aristotle noted, if you have a pure democracy and you have a few rich people and a lot of uh, poor people, of course they're gonna vote to like stop being exploited. And the checks and balances in our constitution is to stop that poor people's uh, movement to stop their own exploitation. And also um, it doesn't matter. Uh, yes, there are like, I, I, people of color are being the primary targets but during the Great Depression, when massive, there was massive white unemployment, guess what happened? White union organizers and the white prison population just shot up to respond to their demands. So even if you're white, one day they will, what, your rights, you have no rights. There, nothing is inalienable. And for the last point, I'd like to, you to think, um, in 2016, Trump said, I can shoot anyone at Fifth Avenue and I'd still have supporters. Now, let's think about a corollary. What is the worst thing that the president can do and still get away with it? Genocide? Absolutely. Slavery? Yes. Uh, crimes against humanity? Killing American citizens via drone? Absolutely. I just can't think of what a president cannot do that the constitution limits him from. And so, of course, we need a new constitution. Well said, and thank you so much uh, for that thoughtful response, Isha. Next up is um, Ben to uh, respond. You have five minutes as well. Go ahead, Ben. Thank you, Kenyon. And um, thanks, uh, Mark and Isha, for your comments. I uh, really appreciate them. Um, I want to kind of address the, um, the frame of the question about that it's not just a, a legal um, change that has to occur. There's a psychological change that has to occur. Um, here we are gathered, and it's folks who have generally agreed on certain assumptions about the Constitution, about that it's not democratic, that the United States of America has not been a democracy, or um, I would argue, and I think the assumptions are that, um, nor is it a uh, democratic republic where there's um, actual representation of the people and their needs, uh, and um, that the response of the government to those needs um, is generally non-existent until it's forced. Um, but the psychological uh, aspect of changing the US Constitution is an important one. And I think that it's, a, it's an important focus to, to, um, to take when we're considering the project of changing the DNA of this country, uh, the legal DNA, the stuff um, that supposedly those uh, representing the people or, or in power um, that guides their actions, guides their 
um, the, the, well, the way that they exercise power and for whom. Um, I often quote Sally Kempton, a feminist writer, uh, who said that um, it's hard to defeat an enemy who has outposts in your head. In other words, if you don't know what's ailing you, it's tough to correct. And when it comes to the U.S. Constitution, I, I think it was, um, well, uh, Mark certainly expressed this thought that um, what most people think the Constitution says isn't what it says. And he even talked about going through it and kind of correcting it and making changes um, to bring it a little bit closer towards what people believe it says. Um, I would say that even then, um, the likelihood that it's very close to what the average American thinks it is, uh, would be a bit off because I don't believe, and I haven't done any uh, studies on this, but I'm, I'm going to guess that the average American, um, the vast majority have never read the US Constitution or never read it in full. They've maybe heard the, uh, or maybe even had to memorize um, the preamble. It says some really horrible things and some of them have been, um, technically amended, uh, so we have the amendments tacked on to the end. In general, the folks who lionize the Constitution, um, I believe are maybe subconsciously, um, at any rate, uh, they're probably referring to the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, which supposedly uh, enumerate some of those rights that are alluded to in the Declaration of Independence about um, yeah, that men are born and created, not all people, but uh, men are created uh, with certain unalienable rights. Of course, when the US Constitution was enacted, those first 10 amendments didn't come with it. It took two years to tack them on. And that was a compromise that was made with the anti-federalists. The federalists, that's the white guys uh, with wealth who got together in Philadelphia and drafted up this thing that we call the US Constitution in 1787. The fact is they didn't do it at the request of the American people. They didn't, they, they gathered um, as self-chosen, uh, not representatives of everyone, but representatives of their own interest. And they drafted what they drafted because what existed at the time, uh, the Articles of Confederation, the first constitution of the United States um, did not uh, allow them uh, to exercise the kind of power and economic um, self-interest that they wanted to. There's a story to be told there, and most Americans don't know it, about what motivated these white guys to secretly gather and draft the document that they did. And when I refer to Sally Kempton's quote, that's part of what I mean. It's hard to defeat an enemy who has outposts in her head. I grew up in Philadelphia, supposedly the birthplace of American democracy. And the schooling that I got told me um, that this document was the wonder of the ages. I mean, the, the way it was presented to me was as if the angels had descended upon uh, the building and just inspired these men. Um, the fact is there were armed guards surrounding the building the windows were boarded up and uh, the rule of the house, as it was um, stated in the notes that Madison kept, uh, the, the rule of the house was that uh, no uh, information from uh, the discussions, no written material could be taken out of the building and, and none of it could be talked about in public. It was a secret conquest. All right, Ben, uh, I believe that was time for you and uh, much appreciated for your uh, wonderful context and thoughtful remarks as well. Second question, uh, which each of you will uh, have up to four minutes to answer. Um, just a reminder on time and we will be keeping track uh, uh, as well. So keep an eye out for the ding. Um, given that the constitution currently affirms property rights over all others, how can we rethink property when envisioning a new constitution, for example, moving away from the idea of land as property. And uh, to, uh, we'll start it off to, uh, this question with Isha first, go ahead. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, I, well, okay. I think instead of thinking about property, we should think about who benefits and who who's on the short end of the stick. For example, we have a whole host of imaginary property that we call intellectual property. And sometimes it's not even innovative. And what that, but the practical effect of that is that it makes medicine unaffordable for a majority of people because these private pharmaceutical companies who don't actually do most of the research get to exclude you from using that property. And so the idea is that we have to figure out who has, like, it's a shared resource and we should not think about, uh, and we should not have people who have monopolies over these shared resources. There's a reason why your insulin costs so much money because we have private pharmaceutical companies that have basically held a gun to your head and said, hey, you wanna live? Okay, pay whatever we ask you for your insurance or else too bad. Um, and so that's, that's one kind of property that we never talk about. The other is the other kind of property rights that are enforced are through systems like the IMF, where the IMF or the World, um, World Bank goes into an area that just had, had war or some disaster and says, hey, you need to change your constitution to protect the property rights of Western corporation holders. And if you don't do that, we're going to sanction you to sanction you. And if you really don't do that, we might just invade and bomb you. And that is another kind of a protection of worldwide property where some some Harvard PhD sitting in Washington is controlling what can and cannot be a public resource or a private property in Senegal. Again, we are again, so it's so exclusionary. And um, so the idea that a, a private, like, like the idea that your property is like, for each thing that is deemed as property, we have to determine property is an exclusionary right. So who are we excluding? And from what are we excluding is what we need to understand when we rethink property. And like I said, with intellectual property, we are excluding children with malaria in Africa. We are excluding, um, we, we, well, we're excluding um, mothers with AIDS. We are excluding children with children who are getting polio in India because the vaccines are patented by private corporations. And so we again have to think, remember that property is an exclusionary right. It's a fence that you put around and says, only these people can use this and these people who, uh, can't. And so let's think about where we draw the line on that fence. Actually, we're giving polio to children in India through our vaccine. Oh, yeah, also true, long story. <laughs> um, Oops, my apologies, I was on mute. Uh, thank you so much, Isha, for that uh, wonderful um, context and response. Um, next up, we're go I'm going to pass it to Ben uh, for a response as well. Question two, go ahead. Thanks, King. Um, so property, uh, where does it come from? And as uh, Isha was alluding to here, it's, uh, it's an exclusionary right. Um, and so it doesn't come from, uh, it's, it doesn't have the same quality, the same character um, as you know, a right to life, a right to free speech, a right to assemble um, and so forth. Um, it, which begs the question, is property an unalienable right? And that's a term that um, I think we'll need to talk about when we talk about new constitutions and what needs to be protected. Um, unalienable rights is something that um, I think of it as the highest value that we want to protect in law. 
Um, and the question is, is property that in that category of the highest values? Well, an unalienable right is essentially one that even the, the holder of that right um, can't separate from. It's like eye color. You can't give away your eye color. You can, you know, it's part of you. Um, but property is something that is alienable. It can be parted with. It can be gifted. It can be sold. It can be stolen. Um, it can be inherited. Where does it come from? Frankly, when it comes to so-called rights in land, um, there was a time uh, when, uh, and for most of time of human, uh, human existence, land was not something that was held um, as an exclusionary, completely exclusionary um, benefit for one person or for a small group of people. The enclosure movement is what um, largely, for instance, in England, removed the commons from the common use of the people and put it into very few hands. And law is what protected that property interest. And when I say law, it means here's the language and it's backed up by the threat of violence by the state, by, in that case, the monarchy. Um, and that's what protects property interests and rights. Now, when I'm talking about property, I'm talking about accumulated wealth. Um, we know that uh, the US Constitution protected um, the wealth of slaveholders more highly than it protected the human and civil rights of slaves. We know this because there's a portion of the Constitution um, it's called, well, it's usually referred to as the Fugitive um, Labor Clause, and it's in Article 4, and it's Section 2. And the language says that no person held to service or labor in one state under, laws there, uh, in, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, be in, in, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. So if a, a slave or a debtor escaped and ran to another state and the state and that state's laws protected the rights of those people, the US Constitution uh, essentially preempted those state laws and said, no, uh, that property, that debtor needs to be returned. What we're saying is that the debt the labor that's owed, because that's what debt is, it's your future labor to tape, pay back the debt, or the slave as property itself had to be returned. Now, the 13th Amendment ended uh, involuntary servitude, supposedly, um, and but it did not end a portion of this language in this section. It may have gotten rid of slavery, but it did not get rid of the, the whole concept that the slaveholders and the creditors' rights in the future labor of that uh, debtor or slave are property and that that still is protected. Those things are still protected under the US Constitution above and beyond the human and civil rights now of the debtor. Think of, um, you can think of the, uh, the student debt crisis, for instance. Um, the Congress, decided that it's so important that the creditors uh, still maintain control over the future labor of those young scholars that just graduated and now have all of this debt, that their, um, their obligation to pay it back, to work, in, in fact, um, as indentured uh, workers for the creditor is so important that they cannot be forgiven it under any circumstances, and it was eliminated from eligibility um, in terms of claiming bankruptcy, for instance, legal protection uh, against um, having uh, your livelihood taken. Um, so when we talk about property uh, being more highly regarded by the US Constitution than the human and civil rights, let alone the rights of nature, which under this constitution is nothing. Sorry, ben, uh, the, that is all the time we have for your <laughs> response. I'm Please. sorry, Kayan, I'm not hearing the ding or whatever it is. I, I agree. Uh, I wasn't hearing it either. Um, just a reminder for folks, uh, we are during the panel discussion, if you could um, uh, hold your thoughts until uh, until the breakout sessions, uh, we will definitely uh, uh, give you time to share your thoughts during the chat portion, but uh, please uh, uh, keep focused on our panels. 
uh, thoughts real quick. Um, so next up uh, to finish off the uh, question two will be Mark uh, to uh, give the last word. Go ahead, Mark. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, we're having trouble unmuting. Uh, okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, thank you. To understand the relationship between white men and property, we really have to understand the doctrine of discovery. So the doctrine of discovery, it's a series of papal bulls written between 1452 and 1493. It says things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. So essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and their land is yours to take. This is the, doc the doctrine that allowed European nations to colonize Africa and enslave the people. They didn't believe them to be human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in this new world already inhabited by millions and claimed to have discovered it. Again, you can't discover lands already inhabited. You can steal those lands, you can conquer those lands, you can colonize those lands. You can't discover them unless you believe that the people there are already subhuman. So this is what this doctrine of discovery does and my father, about 12 years ago, was serving on a committee for a binational organization between the U.S. and Canada, and they were looking at environmental care. And he said to them, well, the reason Western people, Western Europeans, like the U.S. and Canada, do not know how to take care of the environment is because they have a doctrine of discovery. This doctrine, what it does is it sets up a relationship of exploitation between white men and the rest of the environment, whether it's the environment or whether it's people. White men, white landowning men technically, have the right to exploit that. In 1823, there was a Supreme Court case, Johnson versus McIntosh. It's two white men of European descent. They're litigating over a single piece of land. One of them got the land from a native tribe. The other one got the same land from the government. They want to know who owned it. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court. This was the John Marshall Court. They had to determine the legal precedent for land titles, and they ruled that discovery is what gave title to the land. And then they referenced the doctrine of discovery and used that to conclude that because natives were savages, we only had the right of occupancy to the land, while Europeans had the right of discovery to the land, the fee title, so they became the two title holders. That case, along with a few others in the 1820s and 30s, created the legal precedent for land titles. That precedent and the doctrine of discovery get referenced by the Supreme Court in 1954, 1985, and most recently in 2005. The TEDx talk I referenced earlier goes in depth into that 2005 court case, which I would argue is one of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions written in my lifetime. It basically builds the same argument that, that John Marshall built in 1823. It does everything but call native savages and said they cannot rekindle embers of sovereignty over, over lands that have long ago grown, grown cold. And Isha was right. That opinion was written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She isn't, isn't she the voice of dissent on the left in this very conservative Supreme Court? Well, the problem is, is when your land titles are based on the legal conclusion that natives are savages based on this doctrine of discovery what this does is it makes white supremacy a bipartisan value so this is where our whole understanding of, of what does it mean to have a relationship with the environment is about exploitation actually in the edited version of the constitution i have on my website i have one amendment it's in the preamble i added two words we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, value life. There's nothing in our Constitution that states we as a nation have a collective value for life. In fact, the assumption is one of, of dehumanization, and, and we assume that the white landowning male has the, the, the authority to decide who is and who is not human, what is and what is not valuable. So I added that amendment, that two words, 
value life so that as a nation, we can actually have a debate. Right now, we do not have the tools to have a discussion about environmental policy or even Roe versus Wade. We don't have the constitutional tools to have this kind of dialogue because the Constitution only addresses the, the value of white men and their exploitative relationship to the rest of the environment. And so this is why we have to address these things in our foundations so that we can actually have the conversations we need to have. And until then, every Supreme Court nomination is going to become what they have become in the past few years, which is what side of the aisle are they nominated from and how are they going to rule on certain rulings? Because until we have a, a constitutional tools to address issues about life and the value of the environment and humanity, it is absolutely going to come down to the opinion of the judge. Hmm. And so we are going to have these litmus tests like we're seeing right now, where it's all about the opinion of the judge and not actually about what does the document really say, because the document is at best mum on the word, says nothing about it, or it actually sets up a relationship of exploitation. The most troubling thing about these recent Supreme Court justices is most of them are originalists which means they want to interpret the Constitution in the mindset of our racist, sexist, and white supremacist founders. Thank you, Mark. That was a fantastic uh, response and great points uh, raised by all of our panelists. Uh, third question, and uh, we are running a little short on time. Um, so you will have, uh, you'll each have um, thir uh, three minutes to respond to this last question, uh, which is, tomorrow we'll, he uh, we'll hear more about the constitutional processes around the world, and we want to hear your thoughts on this. Where can we draw inspiration from when, um, from when imagining a people's constitution? In your opinion, what, if any, are examples of constitutions, declarations, processes, or people which might be worth drawing from if we're going to construct a renewed constitution? Each of you will have three minutes to respond and we will start uh, the responses off with Ben. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's unfortunate, but uh, of the um, recognized uh, nations, uh, I can't identify a, a constitution that I would hold up and, and use as, as an example. Um, it's interesting that uh, during the so-called Arab Spring, uh, mentioning Ruth Bader Ginsburg again, she was quoted as saying, actually, she's, there's a YouTube um, video of her saying that she would not recommend uh, that if there's new constitutions to be drawn up, uh, that the U.S. Constitution be used as uh, a model. Um, she then pointed to maybe the new, newer South African Constitution, uh, because it starts off supposedly based on uh, human rights rather than a frame of government that was put together by folks who thought that it would work well for their interests. Um, the problem being uh, with the South African government uh, uh, constitution um, that it's, um, yeah, it starts off with rights, um, but it also includes rights for corporate property, um, something what people call corporate personhood, that corporations um, should be able to enjoy the same rights as living human beings. Um, I don't believe that we have um, good examples of written constitutions, but what we do have is good examples of how to live. And Aboriginal peoples, Native peoples, who aren't, have not been part of a culture based on that doctrine of discovery. Um, and the, the idea that um, conquest somehow um, brings specific and superior rights to the conquerors. Um, and, and so one of the problems that we have to, to think about, quite frankly, if we're going into constitutional revamping, and I think we have to, it's more than, it's more than just change. The question is, how do we internalize these values? Why do they have to be written on paper? We don't have a community. We don't have culture that is built on a, a real connection with the land. Instead, when it comes to nature itself, we, we look at it as property under our laws um, and who owns it and who owns the rights, the oil, the water, the rest of it. And we're despoiling the whole thing. I mean, it's a huge subject. I don't know if my time's up, probably is three minutes is just way too short. But 
<laughs> no, no worries. I really appreciate uh, the, uh, the response, Ben. And uh, please, uh, we will have time, uh, especially during our breakout sessions, to dive more into these uh, thoughts and questions uh, that we're raising here. So I really want to thank you for your response. Uh, next up, we will be passing the mic on to Mark uh, to respond. Question three. Go ahead. Thank you. Before we can even think about writing a new constitution, there's a lot of prep work we have to do. One of the things I've been advocating for probably about four or five years ago is that the United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. A conversation I would put on par with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that happened in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. I, however, wouldn't call ours Truth and Reconciliation because reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony, which isn't accurate. I would call ours truth and conciliation as conciliation is merely the mediation of a dispute. And I think we need one sooner rather than later. There is a, a, a Dene elder from the land now known as Canada. And when he was writing about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, he used this quote. He said, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build community, you need to start by creating common memory. I love that quote. I think it's a genius because I think it gets to the heart of our nation's problems, especially regarding race, which is we do not have a common memory. We have a white majority that has this mythological history of discovery and expansion, opportunity and exceptionalism. And we have communities of color and other marginalized groups that have the lived experience of stolen lands and broken treaties, of slavery and Jim Crow laws, of boarding schools and Indian massacres, of internment camps and segregation and mass incarceration and families being ripped apart at our borders. And there's no common memory. And there is actually no point in our nation's history where you can look back and say, oh, we had healthy community. That doesn't exist in our history. And so as a nation, if we want to find a way to move forward, if we want to actually find a way to be on the same page and, and be moving towards the same goals, we have to learn how to create this common memory that is honest about what we've done, what we're standing on, and what we need to do to change that. So I am a, a huge advocate that we need to have these sorts of dialogues and we need to find a way that we can move forward. And to start that, we have to deal with our past and create this common memory. And hopefully that will lead us to a healthier community in the future. Well said, Mark, really appreciate that um, important way that rose really great points. Uh, let, uh, to finish off this question, we will be turning it over to Isha. Go ahead. Um, if I may shamelessly plug my podcast, I have a historical podcast that seeks to form this common memory and get rid of colonial myths. So sorry, I just had to do that. Historically, that's substack.com. But Mark is absolutely right about the common memory. But more than that, I feel like the biggest sensor is your imagination. Um, because we have been taught this is not realistic. Um, Italian philosopher Anthony Gramsci says that the elite put this um, way, a best analogy is like an operating system onto your hardware so that it'll malfunction to give you their worldview. And we need to actually have spaces like this and the arts and media where we get our own worldview from what we see with our eyes as opposed to what the elite tell us. So, so yes, um, for the constitution, I actually, re I actually recommend three constitutions. Just look at it. Um, the USSR constitution, there's an article in there that says that the working people shall enjoy the right to leisure <coughs> and ensured by the reduction of, of the working day to seven hours and the institution of annual vacations with full pay for workers and employees with the provision of wide network of clubs, rest homes, and ac accommodations for the working people. See, this is something you, most Americans wouldn't even think to imagine that you can actually constitutionally stop employers from exploiting you. How many of us had to come up in the weekend? So, 
for that, what we really need is to stop seeing the world from their point of view. So let me give you an example. Um, a few years ago, I saw a Washington Post headline that says, Maduro cracks down on dissidents. I click on that. And then, okay, he's, he arrested some dissidents, quote unquote. Like I go there two paragraphs later and it says for bombing the parliament and setting fire to the Supreme Court. And I'm like, oh. And so what my opinion when I read that headline versus when that context was made, re was made true, just changed my opinion. So that's kind of what they are doing is they're not always lying to you. They're just they're just looking, they're just putting on glasses that distorts the way you think dissident. Who is a dissident? In this country, our dissidents are people like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. But when you have a country like, um, like Cuba, for example, your dissidents are people like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. Um, what they are demanding is that they want to reinstate, uh, reinstate basically capitalism and make sure that they have their grandpa's land tenure. So at that point, you have to understand that, see, like the, the moral clause that the elite just gave you is cracking down on dissidents is bad. But then when you look at it and you look a little closer and you look at the power dynamics, you realize that moral clause is maybe not true. So the first thing we really need to do is just, um, try to look at the world as the way you should without any distortions. And that's not easy. And, but the only way that can happen is through connecting with people who are not like you, people who are from far away, people who are, you'd never think to talk to. Just, the more you connect, the more you can kind of see from their eyes. And the elite doesn't want us to see from their eyes. They want us to only see from the elite's eyes. And that's what I recommend. Thank you so much, Isha, uh, for that wonderful response. And uh, really, thank you to all of our panelists uh, for joining us today in this uh, really important conversation. This uh, will definitely not be the last time uh, we engage in this discussion. And uh, I really hope you all uh, will continue to join us uh, in the course of this weekend as best you can, as well as uh, for future uh, panel discussions and uh, people's movement assemblies. So with that, uh, I want to thank again, our wonderful speakers uh, and for everyone who has uh, uh, been listening and uh, tuning in for this conversation. And I'm going to hand it off to Jessica uh, to explain the PMA process. Thank you so much, Kian. And thank you so much, uh, Mark, Isha, and Ben. I really appreciate all your perspectives. Um, and thank you for taking the time to be with us. Um, that was a really good setup for what we're going to move into now, which is the People's Movement Assembly first question. Um, so I'm going to quickly review the process and then remind you of the specific part that we're at right now so you can see it all together. Okay, so breakout group number one, that's what we're gonna do now. Um, that is our time to define the current moment. So here we're gonna start uh, breakout group number one and on the next slide, cool, thank you, Jason. What is the current moment? So this breakout group, this question is for us to define the current conditions, name some of the political, social, ecological, cultural, legal crises we're facing. What is the situation? Um, and we all have different perspectives, come from different uh, fronts of struggle. So um, it's generally a, a pretty rich conversation. What I'm gonna do is give you a couple of sub questions to help um, move the conversation along. Um, on the next slide here, thank you. If someone from the future asked you to, to describe what's happening around you at this moment in history, what would you say? You might just laugh out loud or throw up, I'm not sure. Um, but let's talk about the conditions, opportunities, threats, context, all of that. So what, what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna create breakout groups. It's gonna take me just a minute, so bear with me. Um, and each group will have a small group anchor. So that's like a facilitator who I've talked with in advance who's gonna help move this conversation forward. Um, please be nice to them. Um, and please give us some time to figure out uh, the groups 
once I break us into small groups, it's going to take me a minute to redistribute the facilitators so that each group has one. So just stay patient. I'll let you know when the groups are set and you can go ahead and start the discussion. Um, you'll have 50 minutes and uh, then we'll come back together and talk about what we all chatted with our groups about. Um, and a reminder about the assumptions for this conversation. We are not spending this time debating if the founding fathers were awesome or if the constitution um, you know, should be rewritten or not. Um, if you're not sure about that, that's okay, but um, we're not gonna argue about that today. If there is um, disruption in the rooms, I'll come in and just kick you out. Sorry, but we don't have room for disruptors today. We're trying to get some revolutionary stuff done. So um, just heads up. Um, okay, so I'm gonna split us into rooms. Um, when we come back after the report back, we'll have a break. So um, take care of yourself, but know that there's a break coming up after this section. I hope you have really good, rich discussions. Um, small group anchors, give me just a minute and then let me know if you need anything. I will give you reminders about how much time we have left as we go. All right, let me do this now, breakout rooms. Thank you. Okay, hey everybody. Um, I think we're all back in the main room now. Thank you so much for sticking with us as we navigate the um, tech here. What we're gonna do now is go to each of the small group anchors and have you do a very quick report back. It doesn't need to be polished or anything. I know you just got out of this conversation, but if you wanna share anything that came up that was um, uh, enlightening or unique or something that you think the rest of the group would like to hear, uh, please share that. We'll be sharing all of the notes that came out of each discussion with everyone. I'll synthesize them so you can see them all. But for now, just a quick report back before we go on our break. So um, I'd like to start with Caitlin. Are you, uh, there you are. And somehow I magically knew you would start with me. <laughs> I'm not shocked. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being first. <laughs> yeah, we had a great conversation. Thank you to everybody in that group. Um, we, uh, let's see. Um, we talked about how there's a lot of people who are, you know, disillusioned and asking questions and um, that there is obviously a lot of upheaval right now. And that the, there's opportunity in that. There's also concern in there because, you know, when people are afraid, that is not necessarily when we're like doing our best to act quickly in the best way um, or care about other people. And so that's like definitely a threat. The authoritarianism that has become more overt um, and, you know, bald faced is a concern as well, for sure, a threat. Um, we also have a lot of generational segregation. So even though there was a, a lot of talk about younger generations being an opportunity and that they're more radical on the whole and um, less invested than any other generation in the systems that we have had that are failures, and there's a sense of that on the part of younger generations. Um, there's there's still a lot of uh, division and and or just like not connecting, um, you know, it, it, as evidenced by kind of the turnout of this event, for example. And so it's like you have to organize separately <laughs> with each generation, and that's not necessarily as powerful as it could be. But also at the same time talked about how, you know, in some ways what has happened with the pandemic and COVID has caused um, older folks to need to, you know, retreat. And that has made space for younger people. And, um, and I wanna appreciate Stan for pointing out that that's like thing that baby boomers on the whole have done a very good job of making space. And so now it's been forced and maybe that's a, a opportunity as well and how to, how to support people um, who are younger and taking leadership. Um, let's see, there's uh, an empowered right wing um, as well, and that is a threat. And, you know, the corporate control over the law and so the legal system and the political system, while we have kind of maybe um, more openings in people's minds, which is what comes first, 
the actual systems themselves are still held, you know, by the neoliberals and they're, you know, no matter what happens in this next election, they're going to still be in charge and they have the legal system and the political system at their disposal currently. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Also just that there are, you know, that there are a lot of groups out there who are talking about a new way and, and just a sense again, the, that has already been said here and probably has showed up in other groups too. Of, like, even though right now it's kind of more visioning and obviously we don't have like the power to implement any of it, there is a more um, increasingly mainstream um, what, uh, you know, sense that like, this isn't working and we need to, uh, we need a vast change, not little tweaks. Like little tweaks aren't really on the table in people's minds. Um, and the US creation myth is, is crumbling and that that gives us lots of opportunity. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. That all sounds right on. Um, and thanks to the group who created that. Um, let's go next to Shelly. Are you around? If you just start talking, we'll highlight your video. Okay, hi. Um, I had a great group. Um, everybody contributed and, and no one took up too much space. I didn't really have to use my facilitation skills too much. Um, and there was really good discussion. So the current conditions, um, you know, just corporate greed, um, fear, militias, um, also like increasingly uh, literate and creative people's movements. Um, at the same time, um, exploitation of people and planet. Um, opportunities, so it, there wasn't a lot of specific, specifics on that. We did a lot of more broad strokes. And then current condition or opportunities, um, you know, the opportunity to create an entire new economy, um, which, you know, is would come out of the climate uh, collapse that we're experiencing. Um, you know, increasing mutual aid and, and um, community building. Um, and the fact that so many people are, are trying to change things in a more fundamental way, like more than we've ever seen. Um, and even this program, uh, people were saying was very hope giving. And then the threats, you know, obviously the, the right wing um, entrenched structures. Um, and then, you know, climate collapse and that is going to suck up so much energy into responding to immediate disasters um so this is you know kind of how the shock doctrine works and uh will you know distract and 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 um funnel a lot of energy out of building something new um to attend to um disasters so that's about it pass Sounds about right. Thank you so much, Shelly, and thanks to your group for lending that to us. Um, let's go next to Tatiana. Hello, everyone. I also had a lovely, incredibly smart and generous group. Um, so the uh, regarding coming from the future, we wanted to welcome the future into the current chaos. We were very happy to know that there is a future and we asked that the future please send us help because we need it. Um, and at this, you know, we're really in a crucible and it's scary because we might not make the right decisions. So, you know, because of all the vast inequality and the, exist the existential threats that are dividing people, it's also a chance for, it's also uniting people. So we're coming together in a way that we haven't. And, but if you look around right now, we have a lot of fictitious deities called corporations, money, the power of money is killing people. Um, we have this uh, realignment of social and cultural realities, massive, massive issues around common values because there isn't agreed upon common values or a past merit narrative. But so really it's a, it's a demolition of our systems. It's a disastrous point for the climate. So we got to get fossil fuel and corporations out of the government and unity is most important for sm and small groups like what we have what we had and what we have here are really really making a difference um into what was exciting and and hopeful is that we're there's a lot of uh, uh talk about coming together 
um, from a past of, uh, of our past being power over and now having it be power with. And a lot of the ideas that are uh, in the mainstream now, 10 years ago would have been thought of as insane. I mean, do, like now, like, remember when we had to explain what explicit bias meant? Like now, we, but many people, more people know. And um, a, the, the energy in the world is, is work, is, it's working. It's, it's getting new people to become activists, taking baby steps. Um, and it's, even though the, the uh, pandemic is disastrous, this kind of opportunity is allowing people from all over the place to communicate because we don't have to fly in and, and see, you know, do all that logistics stuff. So um, this, this chance for ordinary people to come together and not blame other ordinary people, but come together and build, realize capitalism doesn't have to be this way. The world does not have to look this way. And we can, we can build larger coalitions because before we could write it out and we can't anymore. So it's, um, let me see, I just, uh, I, I, there was um, talking of creating new systems like um, accreditizing candidates who are running for office and, um, and being inspired by uh, the poor people's, people's campaigns and things like that. So just not having limited thinking um, and supporting each other's uh, creative imagination was, um, this was really great. And I just, I appreciate all the new activists. Wonderful, thank you so much. That's really good stuff. And thank you, Tatiana. And thank you to your group who brought all those things to the conversation. Um, let's go next to George. Oh. All right, so we had a really robust group. It was awesome. Lots of big thinkers and I needed help. So on the notes, thank you to AJ, the Sente, I think is AJ's name. And if AJ or Jade is willing to help me report back. Jade, can you do that? Jessica, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Jade, um, I don't know Jade's last name. So get yeah, started <laughs> until you until she speaks. Jade, <laughs> you out there? So, I'm here. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Um, so one of the things, the big things we talked about happening now is, you know, like the COVID, social justice, climate change, population, as all these are intertwined and, and creating, you know, conflict and chaos, um, having people um, scared, concerned, and yeah, still trying to be hopeful about all this, uh, the changes that are happening and we, that we need to recognize. We um, then looked at um, opportunities and um, people talked about, um, let's see where to go, Having come, coming together in community, you know, talking about working together with creating social justice and um, trying to think of what else can, somebody else jump in, AJ you can jump in too. Right. So looking at, it was an opportunity to look at ourselves and you go ahead, AJ. I'd rather hear your voice than mine. Um, yeah, so we were talking about ways that we can govern ourselves um, away from a two party system. Uh, you know, one, one of the things that came up very strongly was that our two party system is, has really just killed our democracy. So um, uh, we do have enough energy right now in the, in the political system and the political process to um, revitalize the political parties, uh, to revitalize new political parties, possibly pulling in uh, newer people, um, younger people. Uh, we say that uh, controlling everyone else, you know, one of the big problems is that uh, there's control uh, coming from the top that is designed to control everyone else based on what they need. Um, and it's always been there before. Uh, so this is, so finding a way out of the two party system is a great way to, um, go against that uh, systems of powers that have been in place. Um, we've seen, we've also talked about um, interesting opportunities around the world and pulling from different constitutions. Um, we've talked about Ecuador's constitution. We've talked about uh, Bolivia's constitution a little bit. Um, and there are great examples um, 
from those constitutions that give indigenous peoples their uh, their you know some land back, some rights back, and just to uh, make the playing field more equal. Um, and then we are talking about um, some. <laughs> excuse me, one second. We we're uh, the last question was uh, in what ways. Uh, are preventing us from making the change. Um, the biggest one was definitely greed. We definitely saw, uh, you know, greed in the formations of whether it was money in politics, um, whether it was uh, keeping people's property, um, you know, returning people back to uh, slavery through debt bondage and things like that, um, through capitalism, uh, colonialism, and the patriarchy. Um, white supremacy is, you know, one of the biggest factors in our constitution so we need to um, make the change there so that we can really have a governance of all people instead of just those few that tried to amass power thanks for y'all's help sorry it went longer than it should have jessica but no that's great thank you thank you so much george and jade and aj really appreciate that and the rest of the group for making it happen uh, let's go next to tara Hi everyone. Um, also really rich discussion in our group and um, really appreciated everybody's contributions. There's a lot of overlap in things that have been said. <clears throat> so I'll try to pull out a few um, particularly mm, juicy pieces that it felt like. Um, one that really stood out for people it seems like is uh, that phrase of it's hard to defeat the enemy who has outposts in your head. So this, this, there's this disempowerment, the sense of internalized disempowerment. And that really contributes to this idea, oh, well, we can't change um, unless the people in power do it for us. And so that change isn't possible. And there's this tension between um, things like what we're doing right now, this movement towards, no, we can change, we can get more liberation, we can be empowered and the outposts in our head saying, no, we can't. Um, and that really lends itself with um, the individualization, isolation, um, where we kind of move into a self-protecting mode in a certain way. And that it's really through connecting with each other and really um, like we have this growing awareness of how, how this, there's this diverse range of experience, especially with marginalized groups that many people we don't understand our different lived experiences and we can't bridge them. Um, we're not good at bridging them and how important that is. So it creates a sense of that shared memory, shared understanding of what's going on. Um, and then um, how those things contribute to like uh, this major decision point, this fork in the road where people feel like uh, we could head more towards more democracy um, or more towards fascism and authoritarianism. And that, that the way that um, that could pan out is, is with increased violence, civil war, tension, things like that. So fears around that. So those are some of the threats as well. And um, let's see, oh, one um, point uh, that a group member made was about that in relation to the constitution, um, that human existence, like we don't come with a handbook. And in our country, we seem to be using the constitution as a handbook, like an owner's manual for what we're supposed to do. And, and that's got problems when we look at it that way. Um, veils of power have been lifted in some way. There's a way that uh, in terms of opportunities that people have connected um, using shelter in place in the pandemic has created opportunities for people to connect like this, where we wouldn't might, we would not have been able to connect with each other in the same way if we were doing it in physical space with each other. And let's see, uh, youth movements being fired up as an opportunity. And um, so technology, how technology can be both an opportunity and a threat. Uh, the threat specifically with censorship and con authoritarian control with algorithms and such. Um, also a threat, the autocracy of the two parties and um, the authoritarianism in there. And um, uh, I'll end with opportunities. You know, I might've said this one, but veils of power have been lifted for more people, more people are seeing it and options expanding like third parties. And again, the youth movements and things. So 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Tara, and to your group for bringing those things. Um, next is Lindsay. Hi, I'll just share three things from our group, and I apologize because if I say it was more robust discussion than that, but um, one was about being scared that this is a time of great fear and anger, chaos, and basically the verge of civil war. Um, we're now, I guess, to the collapse of the Roman Empire or Europe in the 1930s, and we need to be fighting fascism and authoritarianism and capitalism. Another was a conversation about who gets to participate, the scope of citizenship and whether nation states should be part of what we want, or do we need something more like climate democracy, some kind of more global governance system. And then the third was on reparations and rights. Um, we had a pretty robust discussion about reparations. And um, you know, I, with rights, particularly, we're talking often about rights like housing, food, education. We talk about those often as positive rights versus negative rights, limitations of what government can do to you. And so how do we have a system of government that can actually provide positive rights? Because that's often failed in the US system. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And thanks for uh, the group who put that together. Uh, let's go next to Jenny. Can't hear Hello, you, sorry, can you hear me now? Hello, can yep. you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, we can hear you now. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, well, our group, a, a lot of the same things, you know, the sixth mass extinction, um, the earth being in crisis and us being the cause of it, um, disempowerment, state of chaos, that kind of stuff, uh, heightened focus on gender and race issues, which I kind of felt like was part of opportunities too. I think that was a common thread through our conversation was that um, folks still saw opportunities all the way through when asking what is our current condition. Um, connections, um, connections to learn from each other, even globally uh, was a uh, highlight on it. Um, and that COVID uh, has given us time for retrospect, you know, to take time for some people had even that we have a privilege um, because we have the knowledge and we have uh, a privilege, which gives us, um, which means that we have also an obligation to do something for the future. So, you know, I think that even with all the situation and how bad things seem to be, I mean, six mass extinction is definitely bad um, and the misinformation and dishonesty that they're, um, that our connections and our abilities to work with one another and, and to grow from this um, was really our, our chief takeaway, I think. Pass. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thanks to that group so much. Uh, Millie, you're next. Thank you and thank you for all the participants of my group. Um, and I, you know, <laughs> my appreciation ahead of time if I miss any of your thoughts and we can always add them in. Um, so we, <laughs> so of the current moment, um, people have less power than preparation. Politics are dividing, increasing the polarization and not enabling change. Um, is there a political fix at this time? Can a system that is working for itself um, change itself? Um, this about a cultural change definitely being ignited. Um, as many of have, you have said, mass species extinction, our separation from nature, westernization, and the tendency to dominate, regulate, instead of acknowledging, you know, nature's inalienable rights. Uh, lack of a democratic process. And not only that, the continuation of that by none of us actually knowing what that means. School's not giving us the tools that we need. Um, and, you know, it, obviously to the service of the status quo. Uh, climate crisis and an irreversible environmental destruction. And now we also brought up this tipping point. And this is definitely, I think, the summation of what we talked about on this question, because Yes, we use that word in a lot of terms with environmental um, justice um, and climate that we're at this tipping point, but we're at a tipping point of a lot more than that. We're, we're having a health crisis, a housing crisis, 
obviously racial injustice is being brought to the forefront. Um, so, you know, we really like to sort of uh, bring that, that word to the forefront of what is now. Um, and then, so what are some of the opportunities that we have in front of us in this moment? People are discovering that structural change is necessary. Common knowledge that harm, uh, about the harm of money is speech and that actually corporate influence goes a lot bigger than that. Yay, move to amend. No, just kidding, there's a lot of us. <laughs> uh, we can tolerate more change. People are discovering their internal resiliency and learning that with change, we're gonna be okay. And, and actually I think that that's what we need and people are getting that. A reconsidering of what we need Worldwide downsizing, I love this, reduction of carbon. People are getting passionate about issues as they are increasingly infect, affected by them. Amazing what happens when your feet are to the fire. Technology allowing the documentation and info sharing. Structural flaws are becoming really visible. Um, opportunity to um, build communities and resiliency locally. Um, and also a willingness to explore new forms of voting, um, as we have all seen, you know, things like the Electoral College and uh, only having, you know, the two big candidates on our ballot. So uh, that is some of the things. And then we, we sort of didn't get to fully flesh out this for third part of what are the threats and obstacles, but you know, that was certainly woven in with our initial thing. But a, a couple of things that were brought up in addition were um, the idea that there's not enough for everyone, that somehow you gaining rights will take away from my own. Um, and this, this type of fear mongering is so common, right? Also, um, you know, what will happen after the election? Is the election itself an obstacle if we're putting all of our eggs in that basket and expecting it all to change after that? So thank you all. I had a fabulous discussion. Looking forward thank to Thank you so much, Millie. And thank you to your group uh, members who added all of that. Um, we've just got a few more minutes here. Let's go next to uh, Greg. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, appreciate uh, all the efforts and contributions and insights of um, the group that I was a part of. And one of the beauties of kind of going last is much of what has been said by others, you don't have to repeat. But um, I was just trying to kind of note some of the and, and categorize some of the comments that were made. And, and here's how I would sort of uh, um, communicate and share with others and you know, having captured some of the individual things. But uh, I noticed that there seemed to have been comments that were organized, uh, just sort of the big picture around structural needs, the needs for structural change versus personal. Structural, of course, you know, problems, opportunities, threats, uh, as well as personal. Problems, opportunities, uh, as well as obstacles and threats. Um, and I think that's really important that we need to focus on both of them. It's not just out there, it's it's what we do, both individually, but also with other people in trying to organize and bring change. So you know, some of the structural things that have not been mentioned by others is just the neoliberalism and the, the mass inequalities. And, and if you wanna uh, focus on any one ism that seemed to have been particularly brought out and uh, mentioned, although they're all horrific, but classism was one that was particularly uh, 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 reflected and that you know so much of this all of these things are so interconnected all of these problems um, and you know the other kind of theme beyond um, sort of the issues um, had to do and just a word about the, some of the personal issues that came up uh, just dealing with our own selfishness and ignorance individually but also in society at large and how that's connected to greed and um, you know that that we are in this time, this unique time, that this moment right now is one that is, you know, it's 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 hard to be where we are at, at the moment. There's so much destruction, so much horror taking place, but it is such an incredible opportunity. And you know, many of the participants just evoke this 
positive spirit and the sense of opportunity being unlimited in terms of the potential, in terms of what we can do differently. Yeah, there are all these obstacles. And that sort of takes me to kind of reflecting on how the obstacles and what we shared with threats and opportunities were often one and the same, whether it was COVID, whether it was communication, be it big media being the, the obstacle and the threat, but our opportunity that that realization creates for us to create our own media, the economic institutions that are breaking down, but the opportunity that that creates to create a different sort of economy. Power, yeah, power is being shown and is being abused and, and is just being used viciously against us, but how that is making us become more aware of our need to take power and to take charge. So, so many of these things that we tend to look at as opportunities are also threats and obstacles and vice versa. So um, all to say that uh, the same quote of hard to fight an enemy that has outposts in our head that uh, Ben raised came up in our group. And um, um, I just thought it was very enriching and looking forward to uh, the time ahead. Thank you so much, Greg, um, and to your group. Uh, we are gonna go next to Daniel and then Kian will wrap up and then um, we'll go to break. So just a couple more minutes. Uh, Daniel, you're next. Sure, and I'll be uh, pretty brief. Um, in addition to what everyone else said, we sort of talked about this moment as um, the death of truth, um, where a lot of the evidence about like, you know, our combination of crises is apparent um, when it comes to racism, when it comes to the climate crisis, when it comes to a host of other things, but we're not acting on it, um, even though the evidence is there. Uh, we talked a, a bit about polarization, uh, but two people made important points. Uh, Isha said that we should probably not really think about it as polarization, but literally, as I think someone mentioned in the chat, people living in completely different worlds. Um, and uh, our need to really look at the, our, our organizing from that perspective and uh, build empathy from the perspective that, um, you know, we're on different planets. Um, uh, I think it was uh, Jane that made the point, uh, and she teaches at UCLA, um, that a, in the uh, academic literature, there's a thing called the critical transition, uh, where uh, a system completely changes. Uh, and prior to that change, there is an incredibly large increase in polarization. Um, so that is sort of the crisis opportunity that we spent a lot of time talking about there were, <clears throat> there were uh, uh, discussions around how particular policy crises have opened the door for us to actually consider other policies and ways to fund them. Uh, I think Steve was talking about uh, monetary policy uh, and how um, uh, the stimulus and all the talk about that is educating people to some degree and it might open the door for uh, better monetary policy which could fund things like the Green New Deal uh, and I think uh, I'm blanking on it now, but one of the biggest opportunities was uh, to do work uh, locally um, and to uh, make it a change locally. Uh, and uh, we didn't exactly talk about it, but I think there's a lot to be said and a lot in the move to amend model about uh, organizing locally to start uh, and building momentum uh, going up. Also, uh, the biggest threat, uh, once we sort of just teased it out, is uh, fascism. And, um, uh, but it, 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 the fact that it's a threat presents an opportunity to uh, suggest an entirely new system. Sounds really good. Thank you, Daniel, and thanks to your group for all of that. Uh, Keon. Yeah, I really enjoy the uh, conversations we're having now and also in our breakout groups. Uh, thank you uh, for my groups, for everyone who uh, engaged in the conversation. Um, yeah, a lot of the themes uh, everybody's been touching in on, uh, a couple of things that came up uh, for us, you know, of course, is like the uh, breakdown of the, two, of the current two-party system, uh, creating an opportunity for reimagining and transforming uh, a patently unjust, uh, unsustainable system such as that. Um, uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times in mutual aid networks, you know, there's a growing opportunity for collective care for each other within shared struggles, particularly across, you know, uh, like of the 
current immediate needs uh, when it comes to unemployment, the loss of the social safety net, um, and, and just basic insecurities of, of all sorts. Um, there uh, is a growing, like, you know, there's growing opportunity for outreach uh, across racial and generational lines uh, as the, as social, economic, and political, and um, ecological injustices uh, are becoming more apparent uh, and felt by uh, all generations and, uh, and all racial, like all racial classes and uh, groups and whatnot, um, which creates a, a growing opportunity for unity uh, and coalition building against a common enemy, uh, particularly around uh, uh, emerge, uh, the emerging uh, fascist regime uh, that very could uh, likely lead to a, a increasing threat of uh, of a civil war uh, or coup d'état, both mil uh, politically and militarily, perhaps. Um, and then uh, some common threats uh, that uh, we can agree on was uh, complacency or return to our comfort zones, and uh, you know, in the event that Biden happens, uh, Biden's happens to win, or you know, a longing for the uh, the pre-Trump neoliberal world order. Um, there is growing threats of uh, misinformation and disinformation, uh, particularly perpetuated by our um, our corporate uh, corporately corporate owned media and um, social medias as well. Um, and then the uh, empowerment of uh, of armed militias uh, and white supremacists uh, that continue to fuel their ranks, as well as the highly militarized police state working for corporate masters. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, the ongoing threat of environmental collapse that we're uh, all concerned about, but also to a uh, re-entrenching potentially uh, uh, of of the collapsing two-party system uh, under potentially Democrats, uh, you know, rather than Republicans, um, uh, so much so, but like it could be either or, um, and then uh, and and then also an increasingly rigid and repressive legal system that is uh, continuing to reinterpret basic uh, uh, basic constitutional and cultural values and human rights, but it's also uh, one last opportunity that. Uh, I haven't heard brought up much is uh, deeper uh, conversations across uh, both within and across our cult our respective cultural groups as well. Uh, that is continuing to take place under the current uh, uh, the current pandemic crises that we're uh, dealing with and the converging uh, social, political, and economic crises uh, and ecological crises that we're that we're seeing ourselves in. All right, thank you so much, Kian, and thanks to that group. So I know that's a lot to try to say in two minutes and that those conversations were much bigger than um, we had time for, but I'm gonna take all of this stuff tonight and I'm gonna synthesize it and um, give it back to you tomorrow so that we can have a good look at it. You'll get all of these notes and everything. So don't feel like you need to hurry to catch all of it. Um, so we're gonna take a break now, please come back. Um, I recommend just leaving your computer on. We're gonna have some music running. You can turn that on or not. Um, keep the call open and we'll be back here at uh, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern. So that's a little more than 20 minutes. Um, please uh, don't go away because that's just the beginning. Um, and yeah, I hope that you um, feel energized. I'm feeling really energized. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you back here at 1.30 slash 4.30 and we'll keep going. Thank you so much, everybody. See you in a little bit. Yeah, so I'm just gonna do a quick poem, uh, not mine, but hopefully it'll uh, transition us uh, back into um, the conversation. Um, I believe this poem was written in 1951. Uh, it's called Harlem. Uh, I think a lot of you probably know it by a different name. Um, I've actually used it at a number of protests and uh, speaking engagements myself, and it's one of my favorites, uh, so I'm just going to jump into it. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink? like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load 
or does it explode? And, and that's Harlem uh, by Langston Hughes, uh, also known as A Dream Deferred. Thank you so much, Daniel. Really appreciate that. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming back. Thank you for sticking with this really long process. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna now remind us about the PMA process and show you where we're at in that process and what the next section is. Okay, so now we're on breakout group number two, which is our time to build a vision for what a people's constitution could look like. This is our moment to be visionary and revolutionary and bold. So the question we're gonna to answer together in the same format is where do we want to go? Um, so this is an opportunity for us to be really big. The challenge is to envision a radically better, more just, sustainable and democratic future. Thinking bigger than what people have told us is possible or likely or um, what is our box of possibilities that we've been handed and how do we sort of tear that apart? Um, so when we set down the fear and the what ifs and the like, big question marks that come with how and think what actually is the world that we want and deserve and what would it be like if we were gonna write a constitution today? Um, so some of the questions that are gonna help guide that are if we were gonna create a constitution today, what would we want to include? Um, protections, rights, uh, maybe structure. Um, I'm sure you all have thoughts about this because you're here right now. So um, this is your moment to uh, think big. So we're gonna break into uh, small groups again, different groups, they'll be random again. Um, same as last time, it'll take me a moment to put all the facilitators in groups. Um, and so just give me a second, I'll let you know when that's complete and you'll have the same amount of time as last time. I will bring you back uh, same as we did and then we'll debrief. Um, this is the vision that's gonna inform what we do tomorrow and how we uh, start planning more concretely to realize this vision. So this is the fun part, I think. Um, all right, and also I just wanted to make a quick announcement in case anyone is using social media right now or taking photos or tweeting. Um, if you could use the hashtag people's constitution, uh, that way we can find them later. I'll put that in the chat here. Constitution is not an easy word to put in a hashtag, I understand, but we do hard things. Okay, so I'm gonna do breakout groups now. Thanks for bearing with me and um, onward to visionary goodness. Thank you. Okay, there's our pre-breakout number. That's great. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so we're gonna do like we did last time, a quick go around to all the facilitators to give me a quick, brief, concise report backs, anything that stood out. And um, if someone reported before you and you just wanna echo what they said, you can say that rather than repeating what they said. Thank you so much for holding down the groups, y'all. Really appreciate it. So let's start with um, let's see. Can we start with Keon this time? Sure thing. Uh, oops, sorry, I didn't need to. There you go. Um, yeah, it was a really great discussion. Thank you so much uh, for folks uh, who participated and uh, for all your ideas and thoughts on this. Um, so we focus a lot of our time on like what we would like to see included within the constitution added in that has, hasn't already been explicitly stated. Uh, first and foremost was healthcare for all um, uh, and particularly healthcare, not necessarily just Medicare for all, um, but like, you know, healthcare as a human right, um, rights of nature um, with examination, examines of like, you know, earth rights and the Gaia theory and such, um, right to basic necessities, food, water, shelter, rights of labor, uh, women's rights, um, uh, rights to education, rights to youth and future generations, fair commerce, consumer rights, and uh, something that I thought we should add as well, and uh, rights to privacy, uh, of course, being enshrined in there. Um, some of the key values too that we wanted to make sure are incorporated in is like, you know, um, we wanna make sure that we are fostering and promoting explicitly within our constitution, how much we give back to our community and the, like what we owe to future generations. Um, uh, making sure that, you know, from the jump, from the preamble, that it is a human-centered uh, constitution that can include also a clear definition of who is a person uh, within that, that was originally missing from the constitution. 
um, worker owned cooperative economy, something that like, you know, allows people the freedom to choose uh, where they like where they work and like, you know, their, their, their definition and pursuit of meaningful labor, um, as well as like, you know, cleared um, rights to living wage, unionization, paid sick leave, paternal leave, all that stuff that's currently missing. Um, and also, of course, redefinition, like redefining uh, our, our, uh, the term of property and making clear that it's not human beings, but other things as well, and a clear guarantee of inclusive uh, of inalienable rights that are inclusive of all people. And of course, explicitly stripping corporations of any rights whatsoever, uh, or any inalienable rights uh, and defining their privileges, as well as uh, some of the things we wanted to keep um, was, uh, you know, um, abolition of slavery while removing the, uh, uh, like, you know, the forced labor of prisoners uh, loophole, uh, trial by jury, uh, search and seizure protections, uh, freedom of speech with the clear definition that money is not speech, freedom of the press uh, with a little bit more nuanced understanding of like, you know, uh, 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 of what it like, you know, who like conditions maybe for free, like having that freedom, uh, particularly removing the something that way that removes the profit motive that's currently enjoyed by the our corporate owned media mainstream. And then uh, some are like some Article One powers, but with deeper elaboration and definitions of what those powers explicitly are. Um, I didn't get into structure much, but like some of the things that we uh, that were ideas were raised was uh, ranked pairs voting that uh, can uh, eliminate some uh, incentives to lie or cheat uh, within the process. Um, periodic citizen assemblies for revisiting the Constitution, uh, maybe even like examining it once every generation. Uh, but that periodic examination, clear elimination of the two party system replaced with a coalition based or parliamentary system and uh, single houses of Congress, like a unicameral legislature uh, and also a weaker executive branch, uh, perhaps add including more than one leader or representative uh, of our nation for the like to the rest of the world. Sweet, thank you so much, Kian. Um, appreciate that and your group who made that happen. And I'll, I'll, I'll preface to that there's no way all of the things are gonna be said in this group. So just know that we'll put all of this together so we have it in one place. And if you're not hearing your ideas represented right here, they will be. Um, thanks for being concise, everybody. Next, let's go to uh, Greg. Uh, well, we started with leaving Universal Declaration of Human Rights, just about everything in there is, uh, is tre tremendous and a good place to start. As a, uh, as a basis and add to it things like HJR 48, uh, having a national referendum provision so that people could vote on going to war, having trade deals or ending, sending the National Guard to places, uh, reclaiming the commons, having greater uh, democratization of our airways, that'd be a way to control the media and you know, protect uh, uh, basic um, air, water and land. Uh, rights of nature, of course, empowering people and communities to speak on behalf of. And so uh, that, that's sort of in the spirit of the cell death amendment. That was one of the readings. Um, Bill of Rights certainly want to continue everything in it, but you know that's more of a defensive reaction, want more affirmative rights, um, certainly economic rights and greater political rights, ending judicial review, um, democratizing the Supreme Court in any number of ways proportional representation, getting rid of the electoral college, um, health rights over commercial rights, which would imply ending the commerce clause, um, the unicameral legislature, and then a few things that came up that we weren't, you know, of all one mind of, but thought that was interesting to just put out there is, is uh, what we specifically mean, people were in support of the uh, general idea of reparations of indigenous people, but, you know, devils in the details, couldn't quite figure out what all that meant. And I guess at this point, that's fine. The other is the question over decentralization. Does it really, should we, in, as we envision a, a new constitution, are we assuming that we will forever and ever be one nation state as we are now? Or if we're really trying to promote this notion of rights of nature, maybe it makes more sense to think about at least maybe some way of transitioning toward a more, uh, type of government, governance that's more in consort and reflective of things like uh, bioregions and other natural boundaries. So something to keep in mind, pass. Excellent, thank you so much, Greg, and to your group for that. 
Uh, let's go next to Millie. Thank you to my group. There were so many that we could have gone on and on. I, that could have taken a couple hours itself. So thank you for everybody being concise and trying to fit it in that time. Um, rights of nature, voting rights, how we vote, ranked choice voting, replace electoral college. And then we talked about the pros and cons of term limits for judges because so much time and money goes into campaigning. But if we're gonna start new, maybe that wouldn't have to happen. Um, only humans, and the environment, not corporations or artificial entities are represented. Economic Bill of Rights, Human Bill of Rights, right to accurate information, freedom from false information and propaganda. No campaign finance, no money used to control elections and politics. Change congressional progression of law so bills aren't held up and are actually passed when we want them to be. Everyone would be explicitly recognized women and all gender identities, indigenous people, people of color, replace the executive branch with a council, um, address the definition of corporation, goal not being profit, but the well-being of society, people, planet, clearly. Uh, and then the B Corp was sort of brought up as an example that it could happen. Clearly prevent artificial entities from gaining protections, corporate death penalty, uh, basic income, right to just compensation, a cap as well as a minimum for salaries, uh, a right to health care, um, an, an acknowledgement of the stolen land, and a recognition of treaties and indigenous lands, reparations in our founding document. How cool would that be? Ownership of land that does not include ownership of resources, the mineral, oil, sky, air. Um, explicit ban on lobbying, as well as access to staff. Um, representation in government must be intentionally diverse and actually representative. Um, politicians are paid the average wage that, of the area that they represent. Access to Congress needs to be available more equitably um, it's hard to get to DC. And if you're gonna make influence, you have to have a presence there. This has been our big struggle of move to amends. Um, economy should consider happiness and not wealth. Um, three, um, three branches of government need to be accountable to the people and not a court. Uh, education, um, uh, right, uh, education, access to alternative and sustainable energy, public utilities and banking internet, restorative justice, as well as rights of convicts and prisoners. Um, I'm sure I missed some things. Things that we did wanna keep really quickly, preemption cause, Ninth Amendment uh, preamble, um, with some adjustments maybe, freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, but corporations couldn't own them, a right to assemble, um, and the right to redress. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Sorry, that was thank long, you so but. much, Millie. And thank you to the group who um, brought those things. Let's go next to Daniel. Thanks. And I'll skip the th things that um, we said uh, that uh, other groups covered and highlight some of the ones that uh, we didn't. Um, so, housing as a human right, a right to food, clean water, and air. Uh, get rid of the Senate. Um, uh, I will reiterate the basics, uh, get money out of politics, 28th Amendment to start um, public financing of elections. We talked about having a Department of Peace uh, rather than a Department of Defense um, or war, agreed with executive branch reform, and of course the rights of nature. Um, uh, I think it was Dave who said that love and logic should uh, guide public policy. Um, a mixture of those, uh, outlawing billionaires, um, access to the internet should be a human right, uh, and private funding of government and lobbying, uh, outlaw all forms of state slavery, including debt, bondage, sexual bondage, and involuntary servitude, agreed about reparations. We thought we should keep uh, we the people the Bill of Rights and many of the amendments, though the wording should probably change. 
um, blah, 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 in all of our actions and even in the constitution, we should think about our relationship to the rest of the world and the environment. And we should honor indigenous treaties. Excellent, sounds great. Thank you, Daniel, and to your group. Uh, next, let's go to Jenny. Hello. Um, yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, our group was wonderful. They had some great ideas. I'll try to just go over the ones that um, that haven't already been hit. Uh, one of them was uh, no qualified immunity towards destroying the planet, uh, give corporations a shelf life. Um, uh, living rights document, FDRs, incorporating FDRs, uh, second bill of rights. Um, there were a lot of great ideas. I'm trying to read them off here. Um, uh, maybe substituting human rights for the rights with life and injury to one is an injury to all. Um, working for a system where people can fulfill their greatest potential um, with a global vision as we are all connected and an income cap. Pass. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jenny. And thanks to your group for that. Uh, next is Lindsay. Hi, so we had a really robust conversation. Um, a big theme in, throughout our conversation was making sure that we think about economics in the legal system and how much our constitution is an economic document and not just a political rights document. And well, really in, in saying that those two things shouldn't really be separated. Um, we talked about direct democracy to some extent, preemption, um, great quote, checks and balances are to protect the rich from the poor. Uh, rights of nature was something a number of people brought up. Um, a scheme for no private land ownership, you know, people can essentially, um, you know, have permission to use it, but they don't own it. Um, and then rights to bodily autonomy, farming, human rights, um, the kit and caboodle as people have done. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lindsay and your group. Um, let's go to Tara next. Hi. Uh, really appreciated the opportunity to um, have the discussion that we had and um, it just really emphasized how important these kinds of conversations are, how unused to thinking about what we need and what we deserve. Um, and so I'm just going to do bullet point themes, um, at which some of which emphasize what's happened before, what's been mentioned before, but people and planet over profit. Uh, democracy that really includes all people, uh, so explicit egalitarian uh, statements, community self-government, rights of nature, a livable world, clean air, clean water, uh, non-toxic land, health care, uh, right to health care, education, income, basic survival, uh, workers' rights, and, and, and then spinning off workers' rights, but really more largely the theme of the people affected by the decision-making that's happening have a seat at the table. And then um, a whole range of things on protections, uh, the theme of protections on abuse of power, whether that's by elected officials, judges, Supreme Court, lobbying, corporations, um, protections from war and use of violence for disputes. And then we also uh, in order to expand our sense of what what rights are possible, um, because like you talk about our box, right? Um, in order to break out of that box, it, we we poked around a little bit on the Constitute Project website um, to look at some of the constitutions from other countries, and also emphasized how the the average norm for other countries reworking, reimagining their constitution is about every 19 years or so. And so we really are a standout um, country in that way for the length of time we haven't done that. So pass. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And thanks for saying that. Um, thanks, Tara. 
Okay, next um, we're going to go to uh, Edward Dodson is going to report back for George's group. Um, so if you want to just unmute yourself and start talking, we'll find you. Okay, hopefully George will chime in if, if I miss anything, it's important. Uh, it seems like the other groups have covered mostly everything that we talked about. Um, several people felt as though we needed to <clears throat> really focus on building from scratch, starting over. Um, <clears throat> the things that people wanted to keep uh, have already been pretty much mentioned. The only thing that I didn't hear covered was the issue of re uh, relating to religion. Uh, one, one person emphasized the separation of church and state. And uh, I actually said that we should have not just freedom of religion, but freedom from religion. And that the uh, <clears throat> that has to be included in the Constitution. Uh, there was a little bit of discussion about the need to uh, amend or replace the Second Amendment. Um, the the uh, one, <clears throat> one change in the current Constitution needed would be uh, uh, ending the um, veto privilege from the presidency. Uh, uh, let's see what else. Um, uh, several people talked about the need for for real democracy through referendum, and the possibility of every couple of years, all major public policy issues would be uh, put to referendum on the ballot. And um, I think other than that, it's all been covered. George, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> folks wanted to keep the preamble with changes yeah. the fifth amendment and <clears throat> proportional one, representation oh. proportional representation and instant runoff voting thanks randy you're welcome um and there was a strong feeling that we have a democracy where the majority rule as long as there's no tyranny of the minority that's all that was left out. So we're cool. Thanks. Thank you so much, George and Edward, for um, reporting back. And thanks to your group. Really appreciate that. Uh, let's go next to Tatiana. Thank you. Um, and thanks to the to the group, everyone. We all the things that were mentioned. We said all of them. And then and here's a few of them, or we would agree with them. You cannot discriminate. Period. Um, some capacity for long-term thinking, like thinking seven generations, having some wording for that. I, I do think reparations bears repeating. It's you know something that uh, repairs everything that needs repairs from stole, you know the stolen land, the labor of the people, uh, the let's see, the the basic needs of support. Well, one other part to add on that is the uh, specifically regarding education is this the idea of changing that the truth of history it, um, versus letting the victors write the history so having the other side um, building a social movement or a mechanism that forms alliances and mobilizes the youth uh, we wanted to eliminate wall street and citizens united incentivize people not to have children and medical procedures are between you and your doctor. Um, the group was partial to about things to, to keep, uh, partial to the freedom of speech, which of course was balanced and without slander and speech is not money. And um, to be more explicit about uh, what the uh, federalists were talking about federalism and if we have power shared between the local state national, uh, how that can be addressed clearly with uh, using the the um, lowest effective level. And uh, there was building off of the reconstruction amendments uh, for equal protection, due process for all human beings. Um, the war prow powers provision um, to be strengthened and democratized because those have been wiped out by the court and the right to bear arms. Awesome, thank you so much Tatiana and to your group for all of that. All right, uh, Shelly. Hello. Wait, myself. Okay. 
All right, so I'm gonna do my best. I don't know, I'm just gonna read through it. Sorry for the noise outside. Um, obviously, you know, the basics, housing, education, healthcare, clean water, air, um, and rights of nature. Um, we, there was some, you know, uh, grappling with, you know, mandating things and compulsory things that we did talk about, compulsory voting and service, but not the service model. I mean, obviously not military service, but even community, not just like some two year stint, but something that's more spread out. Um, that is like mindful of people's abilities and, and uh, capacities. Um, public banking, uh, abolish state boundaries and maybe have more of a regional um, system, uh, abolish the Senate. Um, we said rights of future generations, because um, I heard that brought up and that was the wording that we used. Um, disability rights and we, got specific with that um, in particular, and this is more broad, but, but um, it sprung out of that discussion is right to transportation and mobility. Um, uh, these words weren't used, but I'm going to uh, um, succinctly say abolish property. Um, our justice system, something that's more um, transformative, restorative at minimum, um, peer mediation, reconciling circles, um, language justice and accessibility, um, maternity and paternity leave and rights of children, um, right to unionize, and then a more general set of workers' rights similar to what Isha was talking about in the USSR constitution. Um, uh, a constitution that is uh, less adversarial and in competition with other nations, but more um, is in coalition with everyone else in the world. Um, the rights of the dark skies, which I think Caitlin will appreciate. Um, so no more colonizing space and dumping our crap into it. Ranked choice voting. Um, one that was interesting, um, we didn't come up with language for it, but um, Limited rewards to exceptionalism. So, um, you know, and this kind of probably goes along with the minimum and, you know, capping of, of income that people who do extraordinary things should get recognition for it, um, but that it be, you know, in a way that doesn't uh, harm others that are doing the work to make it possible. Um, public funding of elections, uh, freedom of religion or choosing not to have a, or choosing not to have religion. Um, and a right to electricity, water, Wi-Fi. And then we had some interesting discussion around, um, you know, what's worth keeping. And, and this was more, you know, broader, but um, <clears throat> uh, the current constitution does have, you know, uh, a philosophical structure and also an economic system and that um, that should be, you know, carried on so that our, our new constitution have like a coherent philosophy to it and an economic system that is, um, and then life, liberty and pursuit of happiness, but we, we flesh that out more. And what does that mean? Um, and separation of powers, checks and balances um, in a way that um, uh, works. <laughs> and that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Shelley, and for your group for all of those things. And last is Caitlin. Okay. Um, well, our group was awesome. And a lot of the things that you all said were things that we talked about as well. Um, so let's see a few things to underscore or maybe that weren't already said. Um, easy to read and easy for everyone to understand and accessible. Um, the sense that, there, that it's about all of us explicitly to honor the stories and experiences of all of us, even though we're different, we're also all one. Uh, value, valuing life, we were um, inspired by Charles's point um, earlier. So instead of a people's constitution, it should be a constitution for life. Um, the right to survive and thrive for everyone a whole bunch of things that you guys have already said, so I'll skip them, but they're good. Uh, disbanding the military and no empire, a responsibility to future generations, um, explicit 
understanding that the US is part of the world, not the world, uh, focus on collectivism, a um, lot on happiness and making sure that people and, and all life is, is happy and thriving and doing well and causing no, and we're causing no harm. Um, that we have responsibilities to each other and to the collective to help everyone thrive and to ensure that other species thrive, not just about our rights. Um, we talked about the International Declaration on Human Rights too, as, as some good stuff in there to borrow from. Curbing individualism, because we all depend on each other. Protection from tyrants and tyrannical forces. Um, Explicit acknowledgement of what our history has been and um, also some kind of like, I don't know, committee or something like that that is responsible for like checking in and being like, are we still not that? Um, fairness doctrine and media, a right to accurate information and education, no monopolies, a set time to reevaluate the constitution every generation and refresh it and revisit it and, and re-ratify it. Um, and no electoral college. Um, and yeah, that's probably covers most of it. And I also wanna just add that in the past, what have we been doing six or seven years that, since we first had a conversation like this? And this last session used to be like excruciating for me personally, <laughs> because you know, the best we could come up with is like, abolish the electoral college and we were awesome today at um, just really visioning big and not being encumbered by how things currently are in terms of what we could imagine would be possible. And that's really inspiring and shows that there's a lot of potential for this because this is not the conversation that we were having before when we tried to do this. Totally, thank you so much, Caitlin. That's really, really exciting. Um, thank you all so much. I really appreciate you small group anchors for holding it down. Um, and thank you to everyone for sticking with us. It's been a long day and there's 107 of you here. So thank you. That's huge. Um, so a couple things before we close. Uh, just want to let you know that between now and when we meet again tomorrow morning, I'm going to try to smush all this stuff together. So small group facilitators, send me your um, worksheets that you kept your notes in and I'll compile that. Um, so I'll give you some sort of a report back on the synthesis tomorrow. We're gonna meet the same time in the morning, although we have a shorter session tomorrow, 10 Pacific, one Eastern. Um, and you can use the same link to join tomorrow. So just same time, same place. And um, I just wanna say thank you so much for being a part of this, for trusting the process. I know it's like hard to put together at the beginning, but you'll see. Um, so thank you very much. And um, I want everyone, if you would, to take yourself, take your camera, let us see your face if we're not already. Uh, type a word in the chat bar how you're feeling right now. Are you energized? Are you excited? Are you exhausted? Uh, let me know how you're doing. And um, thank you all so, so much. I really appreciate you. Uh, facilitators, panelists, artists, if any of you want to stay on and debrief anything, I'll be on for a few more minutes stick around and talk, hope-filled, tired, hopeful, inspired, uh, encouraged, confounded, heartened, all of these. Yes, thank you all. Thank you so much. Keep it coming. I will see you tomorrow morning. You're amazing. Thank you for being part of this historic moment. Let's all do a little dance. Woo, good for us. We did that. <laughs> you all are so amazing. Thank you. I will see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Humans. Okay. Buenas noches también. Yeah.